Hello and welcome to tonight's Truth Proof live stream. Got a great guest on tonight. I'm really excited and I know you're all excited and I see a few of you in the chat tonight and I will just go through a little bit of uh, uh, names on the chat, what I can see. I've got to welcome everybody from the UK and around the world uh, on tonight's stream and uh, the people I see in the chat tonight are uh, Alison Buttle and uh, let's have a look, John Thomas, Stephen Giles, Sam and Riley. Welcome to the show. And we have Thin Lizzie Borden. 13 past midnight. I know you're going to enjoy tonight's show, guys. So stick around. Uh, we've got Steve. Oh, let's have a look. And we've got uh, Sky Flower, who is moderating tonight for us. So uh, welcome to the show, Sky. And... Uh, I know everybody yeah, who comes into the chat will be on the best behaviour. And if you've got any questions uh, for our guest tonight, uh, just put them in the chat and I'll get them sent for, uh, down here at this end for me to read out later on in the show. So that'll be great. Steve O71's in the chat tonight. Lisa Rod and Kim King. And if I've missed anybody out, I'm sorry. Oh, Barbara Davis, I've just seen. And. Uh, so with that little bit of um, intro out of the way, we will go into our proper intro. See you on the other side of the intro. Right, welcome back. Great show tonight. As I said, without further ado, I will bring Paul and his guest onto the stream. Welcome, guys. Thank you very much. Great to be here, uh, Les. Another week uh, passed. And we've got a great to guest here. tonight. Yeah, oh, it's great to see you, Steve. We've got an absolutely great guest. And what I like about Steve in particular and people like Steve is I'm not going to have a lot to say, which is great. <laughs> uh, it's going to be easy. So we've got Steve Stockton. Writer, researcher, what I would like to say multi-phenomena researcher because I don't think there's much within the field of unexplained phenomena that Steve has not looked into. Some parts of it he'll have experienced himself. He's written five books and he tells me just before the stream he's got another three in the pipeline. So Steve, welcome to Truth Proof. Oh, good, good to be here, Paul. We are blessed. I love you guys. I'm happy to be here. Been excited about this since we we planned it, and I see a lot of people. My people in the chat. Ted Branston's here. Uh, Thin Lizzie Borden. She's uh, my co-host over on Thirteen Past Midnight. You said hi to me. I was in the chat on my phone. That's actually my other channel, uh, my paranormal well, channel. So, <laughs> do you know, Steve? I've I've received quite a lot of one-liners and comments when as I've posted that you're coming on. You know, Steve Stockton, one of the best storytellers of our time. Now, there's what a what a compliment. You know, I'm, really, I'm really humbled, good. But, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, and, and I, lot, lots of great people with good things to say about Steve Stockton. And uh, I think it's going to speak for itself anyway. But shall we wind back to your earliest beginnings, Steve? And I think we're going back to maybe you tell me summer of 1969. You you had your own experience. Um, um, I'm hoping I'm right. Gap, I'm, I'm trying to figure out which experience you're talking about. Probably the well, first apparition well, you, you, that you, I ever saw. <laughs> well, yeah, you just you just fire at us, Steve. You take us there. Yeah, I was uh, between uh, five years old and or between five and six years old. And, uh, we lived out in the country. The driveway was uh, 212 feet exactly from the house to the, the the road, country road. And I know that because later on I measured it when I was doing BM <laughs> races as an older kid. I was about halfway out in the yard. We lived on 26 acres out in the country. Only about five of that were cleared off. So the yard was full of pine trees and things. I was about halfway. So a hundred feet from the house, hundred feet from the road. Uh, saw a car come down to the, the T, un inverted T intersection there. And the guy stops and suddenly I see what looks like a child run out from behind the car and run catty corner across in front of the car. And it's obvious that the driver didn't see him. And I'm thinking, oh, that kid's going to get run over. So I started walking that direction. 
Well, in the meantime, the kid runs down into our yard. The guy in the car paid no mind. He turned and went down the dead end toward the lake there. And uh, the little kid runs down into our yard. And if you've ever observed children that have just barely mastered the art of walking, they'll start running sometimes and they don't really know how to stop. So they'll just fall down. Well, that's what this little boy did. Little blonde haired boy wearing blue clothing. And when he fell, he just wasn't there anymore. He just disappeared. So I, I didn't take my eye off the spot. I went right to it. There was no hole there that a kid could have fallen in. Nothing that I could have mistaken for a small child with blonde hair wearing a blue outfit. But it, it didn't scare me as much as it puzzled me. I was just like, you know, what was that? That's not supposed to happen. Little kids don't run into the yard from behind cars and fall down and disappear. And uh, that that just kind of started me on my quest. And, you know, what what was that? And I talked to my grandmother about it. Now, my, my mother's mother, she was a superstitious woman from the hills of Appalachia. She knew all about ghosts and haints. She liked to call them haints and boogers and witches and things. And uh, she would, would tell me ghost stories and things about that. But And she said, well, there's there's things that you'll see that, uh, that might be meant for you, or you might see something that's meant for somebody else, or you may never know, uh, even in retrospect, what it was or why you saw it. So that was kind of a roundabout way of saying, I don't know what you saw or why you saw it. But there was no doubt what I saw. And again, it just, that started me on a lifelong quest for answers. So but, from an early more, age, Steve, yeah, from an early age, the foundations it, were being laid for you, yeah. And, and again, it wasn't family. a frightening experience. It was, uh, I don't want to say broad daylight. It was in the afternoon, early evening, but it was still, the sun was still out. It was in the summertime and um, there was nothing frightening about it. It was just puzzling. And it uh, put me on a lifelong quest for answers to the paranormal. And uh, the more I've looked into it, I've been doing it for 50 something years now. I found that there, there are no answers. And if anything, more and more questions, I have more questions than when I started with so I gave up years ago looking for answers. Now I'm on for the next set of questions. What, what's the next thing I can, can ponder? And I'm, I'm glad that you look upon it like that because there's so many, I mean, we're not naming people, but there's so many researchers out there that think they've got the answers to it. And <laughs> I mean, if they had, you wouldn't be sat here talking about these things and I wouldn't because they'd be monopolizing everything and they haven't got the answers, but you're humble enough to realize that you've spent a lifetime looking into it and, You've not solved it. Exactly. And as Charles Fort once wrote, one measures a circle beginning anywhere. So it's one of those things you can start at any point in the paranormal, anything supernatural, anything unexplained, and just take a tangent. Just pick a line, pick a rabbit hole and go down it and see what you find. And I, I, in a way, I'm glad that there are no answers. I mean, if we had all the answers, it wouldn't be near as much fun. Like you said, if, no. if you had somebody that could say, well, it's this or that or the other, then what would be the point? And that, have, have I you think noticed that would a spoil it. Have you noticed a change in people's attitude over the last decade towards the subject? You think people are becoming more open to the idea that this, what we're looking into is real? Oh, but absolutely. Uh, really since the advent of the internet, but particularly within the past decade or so, uh, our world has gotten smaller and uh, it's easier to connect with other people that have had these experiences. You know, when I was a little kid, I thought I was the only one, you know, did, and then I'd found books by a, uh, other authors and things and I'd read those true accounts and and you know there's well there's somebody else out there that's experienced this or seen that and and now that you know we're an online global community here we share stories I love going on shows like this and talking about my experiences maybe that'll help somebody else to come forward and talk about theirs over on my missing persons and mysteries channel one of our most popular segments doesn't even have to do with missing people it's the listener stories and that's where people send in their stories of things they've seen or encountered or, or what have you. And then they'll say, thank you, Steve, for presenting these. I thought I was the only one. There's other people that have seen shadow people or the hat man or, or dog man or Bigfoot or whatever. I don't feel like I'm crazy. This has emboldened me to reach out and, and realize that people do see and experience these things. So that, that makes me feel good. Yeah, well, I, I'm going to ask you about some of those listener stories and some of the things you've written about. Obviously, I don't expect you to have it in exact detail of what's being written and what's being said, because that wouldn't be fair on you, Steve. But, you know, uh, I think a lot of people when we're doing the live streams and if me and Les do one and just and, and I'm just answering questions and talking, people like to hear 
other people's experience because let's face it we've no, we've no we've, we talked about proof but there's no physical proof most of it's anecdotal anyway as, as you know and uh, do you before we don't i don't just want to leave your own experiences to this early so do you want to fill us in on a few more of, of your own personal experiences own personal experiences childhood? uh childhood in particular there was and like i said i don't scare easy i've been in some pretty hairy situations i've seen some things and not seen some things sometimes it's the, it's the things you can't see that scares you but another one that really stands out and i was genuinely frightened i uh, was eight years old and i talked about where we lived there in the country and uh, the woods were my playground. I had 21 acres that was still in old growth timber to explore and to teach myself woodcraft and camping and whatnot. Well, there was an, an old ditch line along one side of the property. I found out later that that had been the, the stagecoach road, the old dirt road through that area dating back as far as pre-revolutionary times. Well, uh, I was up peering down into this ditch one day and uh, my brother had had a dog lot or something up there at one time. He had hunting dogs, but he was long gone, moved away. And his uh, structure for his dogs was just kind of rotting into the ground. And I, I looked down in the ditch and didn't, didn't see anything of uh, any uh, interest or anything. It was probably eight, 10 feet deep, something like that steep banked. And I just, I turned to walk away. And as I started to walk away, I heard something in the ditch. And it was obvious that it was coming up over over the side of the ditch. Well, I turned around just in time, and I'm eight years old, mind you. Whatever it was, it came up out of the ditch and was coming straight toward me, but I couldn't see a thing. I could see really? the effects it was having. Leaves were being kicked up, tree branches yeah. a lot higher than my head were being knocked out of the way. And I could actually feel the footfalls. Whatever it was, it was large enough to, I could feel the ground shake. And uh, once the fear and the paralysis broke, I ran screaming back down the hill. Uh, I was probably a quarter mile from the house. And uh, my mom heard me. I was making such a racket that she was out on the back porch. And I was just, yeah, just right by her, you know, still screaming. Well, well you, you know, Steve, you've taken one of my questions straight away. I'm going to ask you about the thing <laughs> in the ditch. Well, that's great. It's absolutely brilliant. Because I noted that you'd said that there were two things that had scared you. So after you've done the thing in the ditch, We'll do the Beast of Swanson Lane, yeah, is it? That's that's Excellent. the other one. And then there's one more time that I haven't written about, but I have talked about when I was more scared than both those times put together, but I'll get to that. But oh, anyway, whatever don't. that was, it chased me out away from the ditch. And um, I went into the house. My mother finally got me calmed down. My dad came home from work and my brother just happened to stop by. And they went up there and looked. They could see where something had disturbed the ground. And they were asking me questions. Well, was it a bear? Was it a deer? Was it a, a big cat? We had, uh, I don't want to say panthers. They're, supposedly they don't exist in the South, even though people see them. But there are some big cats. There's some bobcats and things there. And I'm like, no, no, no. I know, I know what all those things look like. We live great close to the Great Smoky Mountains. I'd seen bear in the wild. I'd seen deer. Whatever it was, it was big, but I couldn't see it. I could just see the effects. And, so uh, I did, 52 years later, what do you think it was now, if you were to have a Well, guess? there's a second part to that story. When we were getting ready to move from there, when I was 15 years old, we'd sold that property and bought a house in a subdivision several miles away. And I was just out walking around in the woods, uh, taking in my old haunts and things, knowing that that was probably the last time I would see them, at least under that circumstance. Because I had, you know, forts that I'd built in the woods and uh, circles where I had fires and things. And I walked back <laughs> up to the ditch and I stood there in the same exact spot. I looked down in there and I kind of chuckling to myself. I'm 15 years old now. I'm fearless. You know, I was eight years old at the, when that first happened. And I, I just I wonder what scared me when I was a kid. Well, I turned to walk away and I hear this familiar sound. Something in the leaves. I look back. Hand to heaven. Something came up out of the ditch again. Couldn't see it coming straight for me, leaves are flying, limbs are being knocked out of the way. And uh, I didn't run screaming and crying that time, but I didn't waste any time getting off the hill. And that was probably about three months before we moved from there, never been back. Uh, but there's an even more to this story as Paul Harvey yeah, would say, please, here's, please. here's the rest of the story. But uh, flash forward another few years, I'm about 20, 21 years old. I was working at a, a place in West Knoxville, an area known as Cedar Bluff. And a guy that I worked with had invited me to a party after work. And I only knew this guy from work, didn't even really know him there, but it was nearby. So I went. 
I uh, went a bunch of people there. I knew no one. And uh, some of the girls that were in attendance had dug a Ouija board out from under the host's couch. So they set it up and they're, they're, they're going around the room and asking people questions and letting them work on the spirit board answer. Well, they get to me and I thought, I've got a good one for you. And this is all I said. What scared me as a child? That was it. No more. And again, I knew no one here. I, I hadn't told that story to anybody other than my immediate family. And uh, so the, the Ouija board starts doing its thing and it spells out W A T E R S P R I T E. They look at me and I just shrug my shoulders. I don't know. So they were making a joke. Well, maybe it's thirsty. It wants a cup of water. It wants a Sprite, you know, it wants a soda or something. So they went on to somebody else, but I filed that away in my head. And uh, now this was a decade or so before the advent of the internet. Uh, the next day I had off, which I think was the next day. That was why I went to the party in the first place. I went to the big library in downtown Knoxville and I went up to the reference desk and I, I asked the reference librarian, I said, what can you tell me? about a water sprite or a water spirit. Well, she goes off into the stacks and I sit down at the table. She comes back a few minutes later. She's got a big stack of books. She opens it up and it's a book about uh, mythology and folklore and uh, elementals and things like that. And there is a spirit called a naiad and it's a protector of the waters. And it's, uh, it's one of the fey folk, but it's not this little gossamer Tinkerbell type fairy that we've been Disneyfied into believing in. Some of the, the folk, and if you look into the legends of the Fae from uh, the Celtic countries and places like that where it was almost and maybe still is a religion, some of those things are frightening. Well, anyway, the Naiad, and it's, it's the guardian of the water. Well, this particular property in that ditch where I was, just down the hill from that on the other side, there were seven natural springs there. Six of them flowed out of the hillsides. And one was an artesian spring, came up into a, all flowed into a creek, which flowed into the lake, maybe a hundred yards or so away, uh, previously a river until it had been dammed up to make the lake. So there was the answer from the Ouija board. It was a naiad. It was a water spirit, some kind of elemental, something that was in there, a protector of the waters. There's also a dryad that's a protector of the trees and the woods. But uh, I, according to the Ouija board, that's what it was that's and it that, was. that makes as much sense as anything yeah, yeah. So. and when you talk about a water sprite you imagine something big but i should imagine whatever this was could present as more than one thing perhaps or create that influence on the trees i don't know i mean i guess we'll never know but I, you've looked into that steve and that answer definitely satisfies you and for potential. strangers using a Ouija board at a party to come up with that yeah, answer, that's, that's correct that even adds to the spooky effect but other than that I don't know I have no idea of what it was or what it before could have we, been I, before we go to the beast of swans I've not looked at my note now Swanson Lake I think it was wasn't it Lane uh, Swanson Lane Lane sorry uh, we you touched on running water then have you noted in in the research in things that you you've been involved in that streams and water courses are prevalent where unexplained phenomena occur oh absolutely and that yeah. that's part of the, the legend and the lore that supposedly ghosts can't cross running water well that where those springs were where that creek the bigger creek that it ran into we had a bridge that went over that and if you came down from the house went down the hill across the little bridge that my dad had built into that area that was where we had our garden they called that the bottoms it was very rich soil down there and I would be down there playing sometimes uh, on the periphery of that because it was all heavily wooded other than what had been cleared off for the garden, maybe an acre or two. And if I caught myself down there after dark, I would get the weirdest feeling and I would turn around and run for that bridge. And it seemed like once I crossed the bridge, then I was fine. I didn't feel like it something was watching me or chasing me. So whatever it was, it was down there. It couldn't cross the water. Now, another thing that I thought about when I found out that that dirt road, the stagecoach road had been there since Revolutionary War times. In that area of Tennessee, there was a lot of civil war battles. And I think maybe there were people that on one side or the other, the Union or the Confederates that, that camped there possibly near that water source because it, it was good fresh water. Even when I was a kid, I would be afraid to drink it now because there's a lot of houses and things yeah. near there. But back when I was a kid, I mean, there were people even prior to that, my mother had grown up in the area and that spring was where they used to carry water from. So I think that soldiers may have camped there, been ambushed and killed. I think there was bloodshed there. I used to find uh, 
the Civil War, many balls, a little lead bullets. And then uh, we found a, a broken Civil War bayonet down there one time when we were burning an old tree. So I think there'd been some bloodshed there. There'd been some other things happen. Uh, there was also a tale of buried treasure there. There, there were some guys that robbed the stagecoach. Uh, the railroad depot there was Solway. Uh, they, I think maybe it was the train. They robbed either the train or the stagecoach and hid the gold somewhere near there. They uh, caught the men and killed them. But the did gold, you search uh, for it? I, I did. I had just a little <laughs> dinky metal detector like the one from Radio Shack, and I couldn't find anything. But we had a guy just show up one time. He was from California, and he had heard the legend of the story, you know, the, the hidden gold. And the strange thing about that, uh, there was an old house there on the property. Now, this is long before my time, but uh, it, had, it had fallen in. I think lightning had struck it and it had been on fire and stuff. And my dad and my brother were in there kind of poking around. And behind a, a rock in the fireplace, they had they found a map, but it had gotten wet and they couldn't make much out of it. And they thought it was just some kids playing or whatever. But then here this guy shows up from California. He'd heard the story of the hidden gold and he had a device called a Spanish dip needle or Spanish dipping needle. I don't understand exactly how it works but it has a witness chamber and like if you're looking for gold you put a little bit of gold in this witness chamber and it's almost like a, a, the forked branch that you douse with like a willow wand or something like that my, my dad was a, a water dowser but you use this thing it's a mechanical device and with that witness chamber it helps you find what you put in there and it pulled from all the way out at the, 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 the country road to down there by the artesian spring and he dug a hole uh, big enough that he could get down in and as far as i know he didn't find anything if he did he didn't share it with us or he didn't admit to it but uh yeah, well. <laughs> don't know <laughs> he may have come back and got it later so, so you, you touched on your, your dad and your brother did, brothers and sisters steve or did they, they experience anything or uh just the one brother and uh, i was a late in life unexpected baby my brother was 17 years older than me so by the time I was cognizant, he was already married and gone. Yeah, yeah. But uh, he had a lot of experiences too. He was a hunter. He used to like to, to hunt. Uh, he had uh, coon hounds and uh, he liked to possum hunt and things like that that are done at night. And he had some encounters. He and another guy named Eddie had a, a really interesting encounter, what they later believed to be a Bigfoot, almost the same circumstances as mine. They were at the edge of the river and they were standing on the bank, looking out over the river on a little cliff there. And they just turned to walk away and something he described it as a big silhouette of a man, but it was about eight to nine feet tall, seemed to be covered in hair, came up over the bank right where they'd been standing but there by the river. And uh, the dogs uh, put their tail between their legs and turned and, and ran back to the truck. And these were hunting dogs. I mean, these are yeah, dogs we'll that would think nothing of tackling a raccoon or a possum. You know, they'd get chunks bit out of their ears or get their muzzles bit. Well, whatever it was that scared the dogs, they literally wet themselves and ran away. And uh, my brother and, and Eddie didn't spend any time getting away from there either. But I believe that was a Sasquatch or a Bigfoot. Uh, same area, but on the other side of the river, some people were having a, a party one night. And across the river up on a bluff, they saw what they believed to be a Bigfoot, some big man-like creature. It was uh, roaring and yelling, and they turned their uh, spotlights their patio lights over on it and it dove off the cliff into the lake and they never saw it again but that was in the the same general area so that whole area was weird and because when you grow up strange, somewhere right? like that that's your normal you don't think of it as being paranormal or supernatural that's just what you're used to and my mom's side of the family they came out of the spiritualism movement from around the turn of the last century when my mom was a little girl in the 1930s my parents were old like i said i was late in life unexpected my parents were the age of kids my age, grandparents for the most part. But uh, when my mom was a little girl back in the 1930s, her family would regularly have seances, do the table tapping or table tipping, consult Ouija boards and things like that. Uh, her mother, my grandmother was a self-professed gypsy witch. I don't know where she got the gypsy part because she uh, grew up in the Cades Cove area, the Smokies and was born there. But I'm thinking somewhere back in the lineage, there's an old country connection there. But she told fortunes, she read tea leaves, coffee grounds, animal entrails. Uh, she practiced phrenology, which it's a lost art now, but it's popular more in Victorian times, but they could tell things about you by feeling the bumps on your head. Kind of like palmistry, but they use the, the, the bumps on your skull. So, yeah, when you come up like that, you know, <laughs> that, no that's your normal. 
yeah, there's no wonder you're so immersed in subject now, is there? I mean, all ingredients, all groundwork were laid there. I, I, I came by it honest, and, and the thing little... about it, uh, my mother's family, there were 10 children, nine brothers and her. She was the only girl. And so, so she knew every boy trick. I couldn't get by with anything. But uh, out of all those uh, children, you can imagine how many grandchildren there were because all her brothers were married at least once, some of them multiple times. So there was, I mean, I go to a family reunion, there'd be a yard full of people. Mm -hmm. But uh, out of all those grandchildren, I was my grandmother's favorite for, for one reason. When I was born, she was present at my birth. I was born, like down south, they call this having a veil over your face or having a call over your face. All that is, it's the amniotic sac or the afterbirth. It was still over my face and they had to remove it, cut it away. But in her superstitious mind, that marked me as a special child, having second sight and uh, gifts and things. A kid can't prove it by me, but that's according to my granny. And I was the only one out of those dozens and dozens of grandchildren that was born so, with that condition. So she took me under her wing and I was her little protege. So when you had these family reunions, I know you, you probably never intended talking about any of this tonight and you'll just go as deep as you want, but you've a yard full of people. What it the norm for your members of your family to talk about strange occurrences? Yeah, that was that was always the thing. Uh, now, uh, all those uncles they were into football and deer hunting and and things like that. But then after it got dark and and everybody had gathered around because when we had those family reunions and stuff, we'd have like a a cookout or a bonfire or something in the evenings, marshmallows and hot dogs. But once it got dark and all the kids were gathered around the fire, they would start telling these old tales. Now, a lot of that stuff they left behind, the spiritualism stuff. Uh, my uh, uncle Irving, who was the, the seventh son, um, he became a Baptist preacher. And when that happened, he convinced them that they had to leave their pagan and heathen ways behind and uh, got them all converted and out went the, the seances and the table tapping and the table tipping. And uh, my grandmother, when she passed away in 1976 uh, she didn't read fortunes wouldn't touch cards or anything anymore she just he had convinced them all that that was evil and wrong and, so uh, it, he completely met them the full circle changed their belief system <laughs> absolutely so does that mean then that things stopped happening and these occurrences didn't the, the strangeness stopped no or did that, they just that, turn that, a blind that didn't stop it? they just uh I've looked at it from a different light or different perspective and and regardless i think of your, your religion or creed or, or whatever there are always going to be things that you don't explain and my brother whom i, I briefly mentioned there he went on to become an evangelical minister and I, I asked him that question one time i said well how do you explain the supernatural and he said well from a biblical perspective what we consider the natural was spoken forth out of the supernatural he said the natural that's man's laws he said the supernatural, that's God or the creator's laws and natural laws don't apply to God. God is God. God can do whatever. And that's why there's things that you can't explain with man's laws. And that was the best explanation I've ever had as far as that. Yeah. And how did it sit with you? You, you just satisfied with that or did you challenge him or? I, I didn't want to challenge him because he was a real biblical scholar. This was a man that not only went to Bible college, but also taught himself Greek, uh, Latin, and Aramaic, and he would get in, he would find errors in the Bible, you know, in the King James translation. And right. stuff. So he was not one that I would want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with. I, I, but so, I trusted to... his judgment because I saw, because, you know, it was a unique perspective at a time, for a time he was my pastor, but he's also my brother. And I yeah. saw how he lived his life when he wasn't in church. And I saw him dig and, and go through these, these lessons and stuff so that he could teach. But his, his Wednesday night Bible teachings were just amazing. And that's, I still have knowledge from that that I retain. Yes, but again, I didn't challenge him. Now, there, sometimes I'd try to throw him a ringer and I'd say like, <laughs> uh, well, if, if, if ghosts don't exist, then why, when Jesus appeared to his disciples, did he tell them, don't be afraid, I'm not a ghost? Why would Jesus reference something that doesn't exist? But uh, he, he did believe in ghosts and spirits and things like that. And uh, St. John the Divine, John of Patmos, St. John the Revelator, the guy who wrote the book of Revelations, he has a curious saying that uh, the dead don't return, but sometimes they stay. Right. Now, now, ponder over that one for no, a while. No, it's, it's, it's a good way of, of looking at things. So shall we jump to the, not the second, as I thought it was, we've done the ditch, and you told us about a, a little bit more, but the beast 
Swanson Lane. Uh, yeah, that was, again, that was a, 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 probably, I'll get to the time that I'm the most frightened, but the, the thing in the ditch and the beast of Swanson Lane, those tied <laughs> for second place, I'm sure. But uh, yeah, I was over to a friend's house and kind of the same situation. They lived on what had been an old farm. They lived way, way out in the woods, farther than we did. And uh, their driveway was over a mile long. It was like a gravel road. That, and they, they liked their privacy, so to speak. Well, about halfway down the driveway, about a half mile from the house, half mile from the, the road, there was uh, had been an old, uh, it had been a working farm at one time. So there were still some outbuildings and stuff, but still kind of standing, but in various states of disrepair, they weren't using them for anything. Well, about halfway down on one side of their driveway was an old shale pit where I don't know what they had dug the shale out of there for, but up perched up above that, there was a some kind of shack that was, was falling in. Well, we were down there in the shale pit looking for fossils. Uh, we were both kind of scientific minded. My dad was a, a scientist out at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So I had the paranormal and the scientific and then boom, you mesh them together. So we were out there looking for fossils. His dad worked out at the, the plants there in Oak Ridge too. And we were finding some good stuff. Well. We heard like a noise, like kind of a hissing sound or a some kind of weird racket. And we both looked up about the same time and peering out of the window of that shack that's about to fall down was what I can only describe as like a, a horse's head, but it had antlers or some kind of horns on it. And it seemed to have somehow with the antlers and everything, it was kind of a black hooded figure. And it had this rictus grin. I mean, all you could see was teeth, but it was a skull. But unlike a horse, you know, horse's eyes are on the sides of their head. This had two big eyes right in the front and it had this menacing grin and it was like hissing or growling or something at us. We both saw it about the same time and just ran helter skelter back up the driveway as hard as we could go. Again, similar to my experience, we ran screaming. His mom came out to see what all the commotion was and we were like, oh, there's something down there, it's after us. You know, as far as we know, it didn't give chase. We didn't look back to, to see, but she finally got us calmed down and we're still gibbering like fiends about this thing that we've seen. And, and later on, we both drew images of our representation of what we saw without the other knowing what the other was drawing and it, it matched up. But finally, uh, his dad was off that day and it, we'd woken him up from a nap with all our, our screaming and chattering. And he came out and he was kind of angry. He wanted to know what's going on out here. So we, we breathlessly told him, he goes back inside and gets his shotgun. And he's like, I'm gonna go see what's down there. So he goes off down the hill and we're sitting there under an apple tree, you know, drinking Kool-Aid and thinking, you know, we're gonna hear screams and shots or it's gonna get him or it's gonna chase him back up the hill. But in a few minutes, uh, it, it seemed like a, an eternity, probably wasn't more than 20, 30 minutes. He came back and uh, he, he's got a shotgun over his shoulder and he just, he had a very strange look of consternation on his face. And he came over to the apple tree where we were sitting and uh, he, he kneeled down and he said, I want you boys to promise me that you'll never go back down there and play around that shack or that shell pit anymore. And I, I did. I took a solemn oath and I, I never went back. <laughs> I was probably 10 or so at the time. And as far as I know, my friend didn't go back down there either. But he did tell me uh, a few days later at school that his dad had taken the tractor and pulled that old shack, shed, whatever it was, down into the shell pit and burned it. Well, looking back on that now, his dad was Cherokee Indian. He was full Cherokee. And I think what we saw, he knew what it was. I think it was some kind of a skinwalker or shapeshifter, maybe even a Wendigo, something out of that, that legend and lore. And that's why he it shook him up because he knew what it was. And uh, part of that whole lore especially with the elders, they will not talk about certain things. Um, any of their, their skinwalkers or shapeshifters out here, you know, I'm, I'm in the desert in New Mexico now. Now, some of the younger natives of Navajo out here, they will talk to you about things. But the, the older people will admonish you that you don't talk about that or even think about it because you can draw it to you. And it can just feed what off I that energy. Say to you, is that because it'll <laughs> evoke the. Yeah, it's almost like a tulpa, which is a thought form that's created yep. by energy. And uh, they think that if you give it that strength, that power, it'll come after you. And but, I think that's probably looking back what he thought he passed away at. Uh, it's only been a few years ago. Uh, my friend's dad, he lived to be either 100 or 101 years old. And, uh, but what, what you saw, Steve, it, 
you've described it as the skull, the antlers, the forward facing eyes, almost <laughs> predatorish, aren't they? You know, forward facing, not side facing. And it, it, it don't conform to any animal. I was instantly thinking thought no, form, it was like, something conjured. It had a cloak, you say. Yeah, yeah. And it was had, it had some kind of black hooded thing, but still the antlers, I don't, you know, I, I maybe saw it for a few seconds before, you know, and it just, froze in fear and then as soon as that broke we both ran but what I remember is very vivid but it was like if you took two or three animals bones and mixed them together like a, a horse's skull this. but with eyes in the front and then antlers and then these the teeth were sharp it had like fang looking teeth it, you know a horse's teeth are big and flat they're mm -hmm. uh, vegans basically they, they eat uh, grass and things they have these big flat teeth for for chomping stuff like that but this had uh, canine teeth or carnivore teeth or omnivore teeth and it, it just it didn't look friendly at all of course it was a skull so it's gonna have that grin i, I think I, in the book i called it a grin a grin of, grin of rictus but uh but the, but know, the eyes were still there and they were huge i mean they were mm, like, <laughs> black not glowing yeah. or anything black no no they weren't glowing there was some white around it but mostly black it, it, some stories, I mean, and, and I, I, I get them myself and I've got my own experience to, to which I'd spoken about and the sound ridiculous, but that's what I like about talking to you, Steve. You, 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 you'll say them because that's your life experience and that's what you well, saw. And again, I know what I saw. Nobody yeah. will ever convince me otherwise. And when my friend and I independently drew a little, you know, just childlike drawing of what we saw, we saw the same thing. Because yeah. I've heard of cases like that where people would see something, maybe two or more people would have an experience, but they saw different things. Uh, and again, maybe that's your mind that can't comprehend what you're seeing, so it puts a, a shadow get, memory in there. Can or, we just, before we get to the fearful thing that you saw, can we just stay with that for a moment? Sure. Multi Multi-witness accounts, three people witnessing a UFO, three people cryptid experience. And yeah, I've come across that, that, that they're all they're all sort of singing from the same sheet that they've seen and experienced something. But in many instances, they're not describing the same thing. What do you think is happening there? Have you any views? Uh, again, I don't know if it's like your, your brain just can't comprehend what you're seeing and it's sort of, sort of short circuits, short circuits. I'll get it out in a minute. Easy for me to say, or if it's something that it can appear to different people in different ways, depending on what's your perspective. Like uh, I've heard Whitley Strieber talk before and, uh, he talks about how he saw owls and yeah. it was only under hypnotic regression that he was actually seeing alien grays apparently, but they either put that image in his mind or his mind put that image in there to keep it from shattering. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think it's like that. I think it's what you can handle or what your brain can comprehend or what the entity or whatever you're observing wants you to see in some cases. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's a mixture of all of what you've just said. As a child, when I saw these beings, I perceived the, the eyes in the curtains as cow's eyes mm -hmm. because there's a pasture at back of us and there's cattle. And I'm four or five year old. I've no life experience. I've not many things to draw on. And I thought I were looking at cow's eyes in curtains. There's a silvery gray curtains. And so there's, there's a mixture of both all, as you said, are they, pre are they presenting as, as I would want to believe them to be, I, you know, it's, it's a difficult one, isn't it? So it is. So, and it's, and again, your perception, like we've covered stories of children that have gone missing that were found alive. And uh, there's been a couple where the kids will tell a story about a big dog or a, a bear that uh, took them into a cave and cuddled with them and kept them warm and fed them berries. But you and I know that bear don't do that, but if you're, no. you know, three, four, five years old, I think it was a, a Sasquatch or a Yeti or some kind of Bigfoot but type they're creature. Comparisons of what and the kid didn't have box. anything to compare that to. So it was a big shaggy dog or it was a friendly bear. And and a lot of times, though, the, the authorities, uh, either the Park Service or the law enforcement, will say, oh, okay, it was a bear. Nothing to see here. Everybody go home. But again, bears don't behave like that. No, I've been no. around bear. Now, bear won't necessarily attack you, uh, even when they're hungry. The only time really that you have to worry about a bear attack is if it's a mother and she has young and you get between her and her kid, her cubs, she will kill you, no doubt about it. 
Yeah. But yeah. Uh, other than that, bears just don't attack people. But they also don't cuddle children and, and keep them warm and pick berries to feed them either. So and and there's a lot of accounts of that kind of description from children, as you've just said. But how much will I mean we'll jump to still want to hear about this frightening, ultra frightening one. But how much do you think that the, the park authorities know what's going on uh, or what's out there and what's happening? Well, I, I think they have an idea and there is, a, I dare call it a conspiracy, but you want to cover it up. Uh, Great Smoky Mountains National Park, for example, had a lot of missing people there. The Dennis Martin case uh, that happened in 1969. And again, that was one of those. I was about the same age as Dennis. I was five going on six. He was six going on seven. Lived in the same town, just different neighborhoods and uh, went missing without a trace. And there's stories that there are wild men or feral people or Bigfoot human hybrids up there in the Smokies. Well, the, the tourism dollar is king there for that whole area, not just for the park, but surrounding areas, Gatlinburg, Pigeon Forge, Sevierville. If there was no national park, all those places would cease to exist, all the Dollywood and your your uh, Dixie Stampede where people go and, and eat dinner and, and all your restaurants and, and lodges and everything. The National Park is the draw of the Smokies. Even in 2020, 2021, with everything that was going on, it saw over 12 million visitors. It's the most visited national park in the country. But if you had the Park Service come and say, well, come and see the park and, and, and all the beauty and grandeur, but be careful because there's something in the woods that takes people. That wouldn't be very good for tourism and there it's not good advertising, uh, nobody would not. visit the parks these little towns would dry up thousands and thousands of people would be without jobs so i think there's that reason and then there's also speculation that a lot of these national parks are where they are because of what's already in there that they've been cordoned off and again you're getting into some tinfoil hat territory here but there are people that believe that uh the government or someone made deals with whatever works lives in here uh, to take people for whatever purpose, whether it's for human experimentation or uh, there's a guy here on YouTube that has a channel called South Force 10. And he claims in the Smokies that before the park became a national park, which I believe was 1936. But prior to that, some of his relatives were hired to go into the park and thin out these uh, wild, feral, half Bigfoot people that live in there. And even uh, Dwight McCarter, he's uh, retired now, but he was a park ranger there in the Smokies. He was the lead tracker on the Dennis case. He admits that there are people that, that live off grid in the Smokies, in the mountains, that there are people that live way back in now. He didn't allude to it being uh, Bigfoot or uh, human hybrids or anything like that, or feral cannibal hillbillies, which is what you hear. But he didn't say it wasn't either. And I've had people say, oh, but you couldn't you couldn't hide someplace like that. My answer to that is you just haven't been far enough back in the wilderness. I've been what, in some what places. What kind of landmass we're talking about there then, Steve? Oh, it's, I would have to look up the figures. But, it's, well, you know, not exactly, but, we'd, you know. I, I believe it, it's in the millions of acres. So. Yeah, well, yeah, there's and a lot of land. Let me Are look. there cave systems? Oh, yeah, there's there's cave. And that's another thing. If you look at the, the clusters of the, the missing in the United States, and you overlay that with a map of where the underground caves and caving systems are, it matches up. Right. So is there something in these caves that are taking people? I mean, it just, it boggles the mind. I've set you off looking for the landmass of her. Yeah, <laughs> I, should, I should know that. But, well, you know, while I've, you're looking for that, I'd just like to say to people, you know, within the chat, you know, get, let's have some questions in capital letters. I know Sky and Alison will have already asked, but let's have some questions for Steve, Steve in capitals. I'm sure we've already got some and Les will fire them at us in f five minutes or so, but uh, have you found it, Steve? Yeah, uh, I, I was close. I thought it was millions of acres, but it's uh, over half a million acres. Half a million uh, 522,419, but that's still a lot of acres. I mean, a half a million of anything is a lot. And there are places that I've been in there where I dare say, Another human probably hasn't been there, at least not in the last couple of hundred years, and maybe not yep. even before that. Now, the the Cherokee and, and other uh, tribes hunted and, and things in there and lived in there. But uh, uh, case in point, uh, Nantahala National Forest, which is not a part of the Smokies, but it's close to it. Eric Rudolph, the uh, abortion clinic bomber, he was the top of the FBI's most wanted list for a while. He went into Nantahala National Forest and hid 
for uh, five years, almost six years. And this was a man with no outdoor skills, no wood lore, no woodcraft, no survival skills. He just didn't want to go to prison. He, and the FBI couldn't catch him. And Nantahala is not anywhere near, it's just a national forest. It's not anywhere as big as the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. So if somebody like that can just go and hide in there for five years or more, then what about people that have maybe lived their whole lives way yeah. back in the woods? The generations of people that don't want anything to do with anybody that prefer to stay off grid. Because if you know what you're doing, if you're a hunter or a trapper or a fisher, there's fresh water, there's all kinds of plants, there's game. Uh, you can build your own shelter. You can make your own clothing. Uh, you could live indefinitely back there. So I think there are people out there that, I, again, I don't know about the cannibal feral hillbillies, but that's the, the local legend. That they well, were. do you know, in, in our sort of postage stamp sized country compared to yours, we, the place where we've been primarily working on wolflands, the North Yorkshire Moors National Park, it's 525 square miles of forest moor and woodland and there's places in there I mean the gamekeeper pointed it out to me you, the, you know the guy one of the witnesses for wolflands that there's places within those forests that have never seen footfall or uh, like you said in within 20 years and you can tr walk in areas he said as a gamekeeper unless they've got a reason to go into deep into the forest they never did they stuck yeah to and, and a lot of it it's not places that are easy to get to now I don't hike and climb and, and things like I used to. I've gotten too old for it, but that that was a challenge to me. There are places in, in the, the mountains there, they call them hells because literally they're they're hell to get through and get up there so overgrown with mountain laurel or, or briars or brambles or bushes. Uh, one in particular you can Google, it's called Huggins Hell. And uh, the National Park Service won't even, most of the rangers won't even admit that they know where it is or tell you how to get there because they know that you're going to have a hard time. But that I, I, I like to challenge, you know, back when I was much younger, I, that's that's the stuff I would seek out. So, yeah, there's places that nobody would have any reason other than being a lunatic like me to, to go there, to have that yeah. drive and, you know, I, you, you shouldn't go here, it's dangerous, you know, something could happen, let's go. <laughs> well, we, well, we didn't, we didn't have the... Uh... The worry of bears or wild cats or anything like that, you know, when, yeah, when we've been in these forests. But, uh, and even again, like said, I said, gonna... bears are no worries. Of, if you Statistically, there's been uh, five bear attacks, I think, in the last 50 years in the Great Smoky Mountains. But in that same amount of time, there's been over 50 small plane crashes. So you're much more likely to die in the Smokies in a plane crash than yeah. you are being attacked by a bear. Right, and well, on that note, because we still haven't got to this, uh, this the scariest one, but we'll do that in a moment. We'll uh, we'll ask Les if he's got any questions. Are you okay answering a few questions, uh, Steve? Well, I know you are. I, absolutely. <laughs> okay. I like to talk in case you haven't gathered. No, no I've come to, to notice that actually. <laughs> wow, fantastic show so far, guys. Uh, I'm enjoying it, and I'm sure everybody on the stream is enjoying it as well. And. Uh, Thank you, everybody, for coming on to tonight's live stream. Uh, really uh, great guest on tonight, as you can see. And you have been sending your questions in. So the, the question I've got from Steve 71 Steve, is what is Steve's most bizarre experience or report that you've oh, had? I, I'm getting to that one. That's the, uh, the, the We're going to leave that we one. I haven't gotten to yet. Now, that, as far as what's happened to me. As far as, as what's happened to other people, it's hard to say. I mean, they're all bizarre and they're own weird in their own right. And you don't want to go to somebody and say, well, you know, that's an interesting experience, but this person had a much more bizarre. It's it's all good. You know, it'd be like if trying to pick a favorite child if you had several children. You love something about all of them. <laughs> but there are some strange experiences out there, people that have uh, seen things just... Uh, I've got uh, my other channel, 13 Past Midnight. I have... Uh, stories out of my books that I've narrated over there. But one of my favorite from Strange Things in the Woods is the floating coffin where uh, two little girls were picking berries. And again, you find that there's something about berry patches. Uh, people go missing in them or near them. And if you believe the faith theory, it adds in with all that. I'll let you do your own research on that one because I'll get long winded if I start talking about the fae and their connection to everything else. But uh, they were picking berries with uh, lard buckets. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, there was an old railroad bed down below. It was uh, the, the rails had already been pulled up, but the cross ties were still there. Again, there's something about old railroad beds. 
uh, spook lights, uh, things like that are, are common. And I've even read some things about it being the composition and the materials, how those beds were put together to put the cross ties on. But they saw what appeared to be an old style wooden coffin just floating along this old railroad bed. No noise, nothing. It was black. It was several feet off the ground, but following the old railroad bed, um, they dropped their buckets and ran. And uh, so they told their mother. And now this is a Southern uh, reply that it must be an omen. It must be important. You know, it's in somebody's going to die or something bad's going to happen. And sure enough, in the direction that that coffin moved, uh, a widow woman that lived in a house down that way passed away. You know, who knows if it was related or not. But, you know, what even is that? Why would you see a floating coffin? Uh, another one in there that's very, very bizarre. It happened to two of my father's brothers. It's called the Flying Organ. And this was in the days before... That's a question I was going to ask uh, you about that. Before flight. I mean, flight was still in its infancy in this time. And they were down at the creek. And these people lived on the Cumberland Plateau in Middle Tennessee, uh, miles and miles back in the woods. They were at the creek and they heard what sounded like an old fashioned pump organ flying overhead. And this is on a clear day. And again, you know, the Wright brothers had much more than gotten off the ground. There was no real uh, air travel or anything going on like that. But they heard it uh, pass overhead, uh, continued where they were, and then went up what they call a holler or a hollow, flew up the, the, the hollow there and, and went over the, the, the ridge. And they, they, they'd been to church at some point in their lives because they knew what a pump organ sounded like, but they said it sounded like organ playing church music. And it was a tune, uh, it wasn't just random notes, but they didn't recognize the tune. Again, what was that, a flying organ? That's just, you know, I've, and that stories like that are the ones I love, the one-offs. I mean, you have your, your Bigfoot and your Mothman and things like that, even though Mothman was kind of a one-off. But I like the things like this that just happen one time to maybe one or two people, and then you never hear it or see it again. It's, it's just some bizarre. kind of happenstance that just some little rift in, in time or a, a glitch or whatever, and something from the other side came through just briefly and then was gone. That, that fascinates me. It is fascinating, and or, or the phenomena presenting us something. But what it, it's not exactly normal—a flying organ, is it? You know, it's, no. it, it, <laughs> well, that would scare anybody. I mean, even today, coffin. if I'm out in the woods and I see a flying coffin or a, a floating <laughs> coffin or hear a flying organ, I'm like, you know, uh, no, what is that? Yeah, it's not normal. <laughs> I don't want anything it? No. to do with it. I mean, I'll, I'll look <coughs> only so closely, because as Nietzsche wrote, when you peer into the abyss. It the abyss back. also peers into you. So when you delve into the paranormal, if you have an interest in that, it can take an interest in you. Mm -hmm. And I, for years, I said that every house that I've ever lived in was haunted to a degree. But later in life, I've come to realize that it wasn't the houses that were haunted. It's yep. me that's haunted. Mm -hmm. This stuff is attracted to me because I've been to places where people maybe have lived for years, never seen, experienced anything. I go and spend the weekend the, the cupboards are flying open and I'm hearing voices or the curtains move or uh, the water's turning off or on. So <laughs> whatever it is, it likes me. Okay, Steve, thank you very much. It took 10 minutes to answer one question, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> so, I apologize. So no, no, don't. It's all good. But uh, don't, don't, don't give us a day and ear bashing people if we don't get through all the questions. Let's have another one, please. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that, Steve. Uh, Lee Roscoe is asking, uh, what does Steve think is happening in the national parks? Well, we kind of touched on that already. I mean, there's, if you're talking missing people, I've had people ask me because I've covered hundreds and hundreds of missing people cases over on missing persons and mysteries. Um, they'll say, is it animal predation, animal attacks? Is it human predation, like a serial killer? Is it uh, UFOs? Is it Bigfoot? Is it Dogman? Is it portals? Is it something that lives in the cave? Yes. <laughs> all I, it's all those. I don't think there's any one particular answer, but I, and sometimes it's it's very very simple. I mean, Occam's razor applies here. Sometimes the, uh, the the most reasonable, the easiest explanation is the most accurate one. Like uh, people that are ill prepared to go into the woods, or people that overestimate their their technical abilities as far as hiking and climbing and things. It's easy to get yourself in trouble there. All kinds of things in nature that will kill you just without uh, impunity, you know, uh, but a lot of these cases, too, they have a supernatural edge to them. I mean, people don't just vanish and leave no trace. And yet they do. It happens all the time. I've covered case after case after case where 
the footprints would stop. Uh, and even if it's an animal attack, that's the one, oh, well, a big cat got them. Well, yes, but I've seen forensic photographs from the scene of a big cat attack. There's a disturbance in the ground club cover. There's blood and other um, body fluids and things there. There's ripped clothing. Uh, a big cat's not gonna eat your belt buckle. It's not gonna eat your hiking boots. And that's another thing. A lot of times people are found cool. without their boots. It so it's, it's not any just one thing. It's all the above and then some, and then you factor in the paranormal angle and uh, who knows? Yeah. Let's... Yeah, uh, yeah. I've got another one from Steve O seventy one. Uh, has Steve uh, looked for Bigfoot yourself, and if so, what uh, is the best hunt that you've been on? Uh, I have. I just recently moved here to the New Mexico from the Pacific Northwest. I lived just outside of Portland, Oregon, and I uh, had a, a friend up there, actually somebody that I knew from Las Vegas. I'm a citizen of the world. I've lived all over, but uh, we would go up into the Gifford Pinchot National Forest on a regular basis looking for Bigfoot. There's been a lot of sightings there and uh, never had an, an eyewitness sighting there, although I had one in St. Helens, Oregon. Now, not Mount St. Helens, that's different. That's in Washington, but St. Helens, Oregon. But um, on the mountain there in the, the Gifford Pinchot Forest, we, we heard the yips and the owls and the tree knocks. We did find what appeared to be a Bigfoot track once above the snow line. It was in the spring, but there was snow far up on the mountain and it looked like Something huge, something bipedal, a foot like a barefoot man, just one footprint had stepped in, stepped into the snow and like, oh, hell no, I'm not putting my foot in that. It's cold. And that was it. We couldn't see any other footprints because the snow wasn't there, but there was one huge print in the snow and that. And other than, than the hearings and stuff, I, and I had one, what I believe to be a sighting when I lived in St. Helens, that was small town, Oregon. Uh, kind of like Mayberry, if you've ever seen the Andy Griffith show, Little Town. And I was out one night about two o'clock in the morning. And it, it's out in the country. And uh, the, the country road that goes through on the, the, by the street that I lived on, I saw something pass under the street light. And I could tell it was tall. It looked like a very tall man. And he looked kind of shiny, like whatever he was wearing was wet. And I, I watched it go by and I noticed when he walked by the stop sign, his head was like way up almost even with the top of the stop sign. And I started to go in for a closer look. And, you know, I talked about my granny and how she was my mentor. Well, Spider-Man had his spidey senses. I have what I call my granny senses. And like in the back of my head, I heard my grandma's <laughs> voice say, no, you don't need to go look and see what it was. You need to get back in the house and forget you saw it. But it looked like, a tall person with no neck covered in uh, maybe wearing a black fur coat, just walking along the street. Well, the next day I went up there and I measured the stop sign where the, where I saw the top of its head down to where it was walking. It would have had to been almost eight feet tall. Yeah. Again, I think that was, that was probably my first Bigfoot sighting. And I didn't really even realize because it was just, I mean, it was swinging its arms. It was walking along. I thought it was just somebody walking late at night, but the, the furry, the slickness, the shine that I saw on the fur, that, that that's what, because it wasn't raining or anything. I thought, why is that person wearing wet? I heard clothing? you say you measured the beginning of the stream. And obviously you've been out and measured where you, you perceive this this creature to have been. Is that some, Is that the depth that you'll go to and, and more? Would you go out with tape, surveyor's tape and do measurements during the course of the research? Yeah, I, I mean, I'll, I'll measure things. Uh, if I've, uh, I'd found a footprint that wasn't in the snow, I would probably have marked uh, the place on my GPS. I would have went and got plaster Paris and came back. We didn't think about finding anything. We were just not so much seriously hunting for Bigfoot as just legend tripping and being in the woods where you knew we was sighted. I mean, it wasn't a like a scientific, oh, we're going to go look for Bigfoot. It was just like, hey, uh, we're off today. You're off today. I'm off. Let's go up in the forest and and see if we see any sign of Bigfoot. Do you think about that afterwards, or in, I don't mean regular, but in between times, like you're talking about it now and think, why didn't we go get some yeah. extra Paris? Yeah, because maybe... Well, uh, that track was in the snow. I don't think it would have worked because plaster well, Paris gives off spray it, couldn't you? You could have sprayed it with some... Yeah, some, could have... And it's I know just like one of those things. Insight, we could have done lots of things. Yeah, I oh, that. and like with the Bigfoot sighting at two o'clock in the morning, I had my cell phone in my pocket. Yeah. I, why didn't I take it out and try to take a picture of it? It didn't occur to me at the time. 
you know, yeah. I was just too gobsmacked at what I was seeing walking down the street. Now, if I had followed it or went up to the up the block to see a closer look, I think maybe then I would have taken a picture or video. But yeah. again, something it's, my it's granny, so if you will, said don't don't do that. Yeah, myself and <laughs> myself leave that and alone. A good friend of ours, Chris Wright, who's helped contributed to Wolflands. We were up on the moors, kitted out with plaster of Paris, with cameras. And we found one big print. We weren't looking for prints, by the way, Steve. We were we were out there just hiking on moors and into the forest. But we found one huge print. And I'd never been to this place. It was up a, around a place, an area called Jugger Howe, which is near some burial mounds. And uh, I thought we were coming back the same way. I'm not using that as an excuse because I could have put the rucksack down, got cameras out, took pictures. We could have done a cast of it, but we didn't. And yeah. I don't know, I'll speak to Chris, and every, I reckon every time I speak to him, I'll say to him, why didn't we take a cast of that print? Mm -hmm. It's a strange, isn't it, when we look, when we're observing something and we, we're kitted out with equipment, and I think we're so caught up in the moment that, it, I don't know, the little birds flying around, and something happens because invariably we don't, we don't get the amount of information that we, we could actually get at the time. I regret that, to be honest, but there you go. Yeah, and it's, it's the same with a lot of these experiences. When you're in the moment of it, it doesn't occur to you to get scientific evidence or to measure, mm. to do this. And like I said, the only reason I was able to do that, I know where I saw it walked by. I remember where the top of its head was in relation to the stop sign. So that was easy to go back in hindsight and measure and say, oh, well, it was eight feet tall. Yeah. But uh, at the time, I, I just, I knew it was big, but I didn't realize it was how big it was because of the, the distance I was from it. Yeah. So again, it's just... And then the day that we saw the track in the snow, we had walked up into the woods and uh, we both left our phones in the Jeeps. So didn't even have anything to take a picture of it. No, no. And I think that the, whatever's out there, the cosmic prankster or whatever that, that allows you to see these things sometimes, it knows when you're in a compromised position and not able to gather any evidence. Well, I because think you're right. I guarantee you, I could take a crew of people and cameras and, and have our plaster kits and everything and go back out in the woods. We wouldn't see or hear a thing. Yes, when but you're, you're just out there it. monkeying around or or doing something different, hiking or whatever, that's when it happens. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. like it knows, it, it messes with you. Uh, absolutely. Same page here, Steve, honestly. Come on, Les, it is with another question if we've got some. Yes, and uh, as I said, uh, thanks everybody for coming on to tonight's stream. And uh, we're really, really enjoying what you've got to say tonight, Steve. And... Uh, and thank you for being a great oh, guest. My, my at the, pleasure and honour to be here with you guys. Yeah, and at this juncture, uh, we'll just go through a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, Steve, you got um, five books, I think, up for sale. Uh, if you can tell the audience where they can uh, actually get these books yeah, from. Yeah, I'll even show them to you. They're on uh, Amazon and wherever fine books are sold, as my publisher likes me to say. Uh, Strange Things in the Woods. Now, that used to be two volumes. Strange Things in the Woods and More Strange Things in the Woods. My publisher combined it into one when I went with a traditional publisher. And then uh, I would invariably after I, I wrote the first book, I would go on this show or that radio show or whatever. And it's a call in show or somewhere like this where there's a chat. People say, well, these are other people's stories that you collected. Do you have any stories? So I would bring out one and, and tell it or another. And I started thinking about that. There's probably enough to, to fill a book. And there was. And that's uh, My Strange World. And there's, I've got enough since I wrote this one to, to put an, another volume out. And then the next series is the National Park Mysteries and Disappearances. And it covers just volumes one, two, and three. And it covers not just the disappearances in some of the national parks and stuff, but also like the, the Great Smoky Mountains. I wrote a book just for that region because that's one of my favorite places in the world. There's ghost stories. There's Cherokee legends and the missing people. There's a little bit of everything in here. And same volume two, California, it's just uh, partial California, Yosemite, Joshua Tree, and Mount Shasta. And somebody was asking in the chat if I'd ever been to Shasta. I think it was uh, Amber Scarvey. And yes, Amber, I've been there. I'm planning on going back. In fact, I'm in talks with a producer uh, that's uh, making a series for a, a cable TV channel that you would recognize. I can't say right now, but uh, they're making a, a a part uh, documentary about uh, strange places and they've uh, talked to me about Shasta already. <clears throat> and then the third volume is um, the Pacific Northwest where I just moved from Oregon, Washington and Idaho, places that I prowled 
all over up there. I've been to Olympic National Park, Olympic National Forest, Mount Rainier, Yakima, anywhere there's there's missing people or strange stuff, haunted places, that sort of thing. I, I thrive on it. I love Mount St. Helens. I've been there. Brilliant, Steve. Thank you. And like I said, anybody that will stock your books and, and Amazon. So oh, yeah. would you have a website, Steve? Uh, I actually don't. I've got a stevestocktonstories.com. But right now, that just points to my Bandcamp page, which is stevestockton.bandcamp.com. Um, There's some spoken listen, word over there. Anybody listening to this who wants to get in touch with Steve Stockton with an account, with a story, come to me first. Now, I'm only joking. Uh, <laughs> just, uh, what's well, I'm, I'm a guest in your house. If, no, if, no, if, it's, if, it's all good, Steve. What's if you want to refer address, to me, can contact you. Uh, Steve Stockton, 81. That's the number is 81 at gmail.com. I'll put it in the chat mm -hmm. here. Uh, and uh, I'm on Twitter at Strange and Odd. That's my handle. And uh, I'm on Facebook. I've got uh, 5,000 something followers and friends over there. Really? But I love interacting with people. I love hearing your stories. Um, and on my other channel, 13 Past Midnight, uh, I like having people, guests come on. We have like a, a campfire stories stream and uh, people come on and tell their personal experiences and stuff. But there's my email in there now the missing uh, missing person channels that's the big one we're just over a quarter million subscribers Fabulous. and uh, get about two million views a month and that will always uh, the focus will always be on the missing and uh, i am honored and and proud to be the voice of those that no longer have a voice and the whole mission over there if i can bring one person home or give one family closure that i'm doing what i feel i've been called to do but now the mystery side of that name we do get into the paranormal, we get into the unusual, the supernatural, and then 13 past midnight, that's my paranormal channel. I do a little bit of everything over there. I've narrated stories from all my books over there, and um, I play a lot of the, the BBC radio dramas and stuff that have a, a horror or a supernatural bent, uh, stuff from LibriVox, and uh, just have a lot of fun. Come and join us. It's that's almost so 11,000 over there, but that's my playground, my sandbox, my fun channel. Well, all good, Steve. And uh, seeing as you've got a lot more viewers and listeners than us, all you Steve Stockton viewers and listeners, come and join uh, us. All my people, <laughs> please subscribe to, to what Paul's doing here with Truth Proof. I love yes. these guys. I love this show. Uh, you're one of those channels you should have a million subscribers. Well, it's, it's, it's good of you to say that, Steve. So have we touched on everything that you're about and we can sort of, sort of push your work? Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Um, that's it. Like I said, I'm active on, uh, I have a band camp page where I'm doing spoken word stuff. I get a lot of compliments on my voice. I get people say that uh, I have fibromyalgia, I have chronic pain, I have PTSD, I have insomnia, I have panic and anxiety. Your voice calms me and soothes me, but sometimes I listen to you to go to sleep or to relax, but it gives me the strangest nightmares. So I'm trying to do some more spoken word stuff that people can listen to and right. not have bad dreams. Thank you. So uh, that, that that's pretty much it. And yeah, the books, they're Amazon and uh, they're, they're all listed in books in print. They have an IB, ISBN number. So any bookstore can order them for you or ask your library to order them. That way, a lot of people can enjoy them. Yeah, yeah. They've got mine at the libraries as well. So that's it is a good thing because obviously the books, I don't want to just give books away or they'll not be free, but you, obviously you can obtain them at libraries, can't you? If they've got the ISBN, ISBN number. So Les, that's where we're at. And we've got the Truth Proof live mm -hmm. stream, as everybody knows. And if anybody wants to contact me regarding the books, the Truth Proof books, you can get them on truthproof.uk. They are avail also available on eBay uh, as paperbacks and on Amazon as Kindles. I took them off the Amazon as paperbacks simply because they, they were no profit in it for me. But we are rethinking it and going to let Amazon publish and print print and publish them as well at, at some stage so yeah that's where we're at there has been a sighting this week uh, unbelievably myself and bob brown and Pete, peter b as, as I'll, I'll call him i'll not say his surname we uh we've been going up to bempton as people know now for, for years and years and and like steve alluded to earlier when you go, the phenomena knows something. I don't know. Something knows because it doesn't happen or rarely happens. Well, on Tuesday, February the 7th, <clears throat> we're up there and I'm looking not out to sea because we've got North Sea in front of us, Steve. I'm looking inland. The hill 
which I've highlighted, which won't mean a lot to you, Steve, but some of the listeners it will, but a lot of a concentrated area within the zone of strangeness. And we've got an area which is a little bit richer in phenomena. And I'll ask you about that in a bit, see whether you've noted any areas like that. I said to Bob and Pete that I can see a, an orangey pink glow on the hill. When they looked, it, it, it weren't quite as prominent. So we carried on looking at it. I'd got a little psionics camera in my hand. I, I wish I'd have had the Sony 4K, which were in the bag out. So, I don't know, a minute later, orange sphere just appears above the hill, off the ground, and goes back down. <clears throat> Put the camera on. We've got it once. Now, apologies, people, for the colour. If Les puts the still up, I've took a frame capture of it because it's white. The psionics, however good people want to claim them to be, and they are good, don't give a true representation of the colour. That was bright orange. Uh, that's why I wish I've had the Sony 4K, uh, because I would have been able to get that, to, you know, with right settings. So we've got this, this sphere. I'm going to get up there and see whether there's any ground traces. But what's interesting, and people will note this, that I've spoke about it over the years, it was February the 7th. February the 7th, 2020... Gemma, my daughter, and Bob Brown saw the square of white light. Where did they see it? On the hill. February the 8th, I believe it was. It could have been the 7th. 2019, the military guys had the cryptid encounter about 500 yards away from the hill. February. So we've, we've highlighted a location. We've highlighted a date. And, and I'm not one of these researchers, Stephen. I'm sure you're not. Or just covets the information and don't want anybody to know. There's a zone there and there's a, there's a date and a time. I find that fascinating. And staying with this concentrated area, then we'll get back to Steve because it's Steve's stream. 1998, November, the rock angler, and people will have heard me speak about it lots of times, claims that a spaceship landed on that hill. <laughs> you know, it, so we've got this concentrated paranormal soup all occurring in this this little area within the zone of strangeness and that's fascinating now we can either go to another question les uh, oh and, uh, last thing sorry les i'm cutting across you obviously i'll be sending writing a little report up and don who runs the truth proof website will be putting it on the website at some point early next week maybe over the weekend and we've got another sighting from speed and from dave barker which i'm really grateful for and i'll be uh I'm speaking to dave oh, tomorrow or over the weekend over to you, Les. Right, okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for that, guys, all the info. And uh, I've just noticed, uh, Paul, I did visit the truthproof.uk website and the reporting's page on there, and there is a good um, account of a, a big black cat being seen at the end of last month, which is very interesting. So if anybody wants to fly over there and read any of the yeah. more recent accounts, that's fine. Uh, right then, I've got, I have got a question, and the question is, Steve... It's for you. Uh, Steve, um, have you had an encounter uh, given to you and thought, that's a bit too far-fetched and it was a lie and you think it's a lie only to find out later that the, the, ad the witnesses and evidence and that it was actually true? Uh, no, I've never had that happen. I mean, I've had some that I kind of questioned, but uh, just based on what I've seen and experienced myself, I don't, I don't vet people's stories. I mean, I take it at face value and I think you can tell sometimes if, if people are just spinning a yarn or telling you a tall tale, but especially in the first book, some of those people, they were hesitant to give me their stories at first. Yeah. I mean, it was, had to drag it out of them with a log chain almost. And then once they saw that you weren't going to make <coughs> fun of them and that, uh, that you genuinely believed what they believed. Then, then it came easier. Now, I, there was one story that was sent to us on missing persons and mysteries that I just refused to narrate. And a guy uh, talked that he uh, was out driving somewhere in uh, the backwoods and he came across a, a giant elk and uh, he, he got out of his truck. It just it stood in the road and it wouldn't move. And he got out to try to shoo it away. And it took his antlers and flipped him up on its back and it rode off into the woods with him. I, I didn't I didn't report that one. I don't. That's just a little too fantastical. I think that was just somebody, uh, you know, taking a whiz, as you guys say, just to see if I would record that so they could listen to it and laugh at it. But the, the most of I it, mean, you can tell by the language they use and, and how they tell the story, whether it's genuine or not. Yeah. Yeah. And it is difficult. 
and it's it's brilliant when you realize that you're having to like you've just said drag this information out of people but but once you start treating them with respect or they, they, they actually learn that or know that you are taking them really seriously it, it's like a pop cork coming off a bottle they usually flow yeah. with information don't they and, and, and indeed there, there was one older gentleman he was in his 80s when i was a teenager and uh, after he told me his first story, then he just opened up and his wife was sitting there. She was about the same age as him. So these people have been married for 60 years or more. And he was telling stories that she'd never heard. She's like, you never told me about that. And, and it was just, it was amazing. You know, some of the experiences this guy had had. And again, this was a fellow like my dad. He was a friend of my dad's that had lived miles back in the woods over there and seen and heard all kinds of things. And uh, whenever I go into a place when I'm traveling, uh, I'll go and if there's a senior citizen center, uh, I'll go there an old folks home. Uh, they, they have the best stories. Uh, older people are one of our greatest overlooked natural resources when it comes to uh, storytelling and uh, experiences and things. And then on the other end of that spectrum is the teenagers. Find the, the skate park or the wherever the teenagers hang out. They know all the crybaby bridges, all the haunted lanes all the creepy places to take their girlfriends. So teens and senior citizens, that's where you'll get your best uh, reports of things. How, for me how, anyway. So, so anybody wanting to research this or wanted to, how do you go about then, Steve? Uh, that, that, that's Speaking how it's to start. a group of old people, do you, do you, do you go to the staff first? And, yeah, and, you, you would have to get permission hmm. or I'll, I'll plan an event. I remember one time we put on a little thing. We wanted to uh, basically, uh, there was a friend and I, we, we went and gave a talk about you know the paranormal and the supernatural and and this thing like that kind of warmed up the audience you know and it's again it's an old folks home they don't get out they don't they don't get to do a lot so they were happy to have people come in and just engage with them and tell them stories and and then that sort of opened it up you know then we we moved from that into you know well, this is what happened and i saw this and i saw that and then after the end of the little presentation there we did about an hour then they, they literally lined up to tell us their stories. Let me tell you what happened when I was a boy or somebody else when I was a little girl, let me tell you what I saw. And it's just, it's a wonderful thing because a lot of these people, and it's its sad that, that we do our old people that way, but uh, we just uh, kind of lock them away and forget about mm -hmm. it. We put them in a rest home or retirement home, old folks community, and then we go on about our lives and they're yep. just sitting there. And again, they're a great natural resource. They know things, they know stories, not just of the paranormal, but ways to get by or recipes or how to do things that, that we've forgotten how to do in our modern day and age. And, and a lot and, of these things are going to go to the grave. Yeah, it'll go to the grave with them. And that was when I first started, I got the idea to collect these stories. It was my grandmother's funeral and she was always busy. She was a little thing. She looked like a witch. She scared me when I was real small, but uh, there at her funeral <laughs> and of course, She's still because she's deceased, but I thought, you know, I've never seen her that still. She was always cooking, cleaning, doing something. This was a lady that they had a dairy farm. So she had not only 10 kids, but she had an whole army of farmhands that she had to feed a couple of times a day. Had two stoves in her, her kitchen there and kept them both going all the time, I think. But uh, by the time she was uh, quilting or knitting or doing something, she stayed busy. She's like me. I like to stay busy and keep my hands busy. But there she was in her coffin, and she's just so still, her little hands clasped together there. And I thought, you know, Granny, every story you've ever told me, every superstition, every hate, booger, witch tale that you've told me from the hills, my cousins didn't care anything about any of that you stuff, not, not a whit. And I thought, you know, that that dies with you that that died with you you're already gone that was but i said i'm not gonna let that happen and i took that mantle upon myself i'm gonna write these stories down and that was when i started just writing them out longhand and it you know it took me years to finally get it into book form but uh it turned out really well but that was that's i had that epiphany you know that uh, I don't want to let these stories die i don't want to let all this these things she saw and experienced just, you know, go into just, the ground. Just, just go, so, and there's so many like it. And, I mean, and you know, it, it, do that. Go and talk to your parents, your grandparents, anybody. Get their stories now. Record them if you can. I wish I had recorded her back then uh, when, when I was a kid. You know, the cassette recorders and things were not very good and, and uh, not affordable until I was, you know, in high school or something anyway. Now, some people won't let you record them. The gentleman that I talked about, 
that I recorded several stories in here. He would not let me record him. He didn't want his voice recorded. He said, you can take all the notes of what you want, but I'd borrow the recorder that time. He said, put that recorder away. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> so I, I, always, I always have a recorder with me and I always ask. And obviously yeah. you're same as me, Steve. We just respect what people say. And if you can't record, you can't record. Yeah, you but can't keep, record. The, but there'll be little things within the account that, that you've missed it's, it's, it's easy yeah. to write lots down and, but and, and again yeah i wish i wish i had a record an audio record of those the, the i mean the book's good i did the best i could with what i could remember and what i wrote down but again there's little nuances and things and me writing what they told me is different than them telling it you know it's it's yeah. not always the tale but he or she who tells it they, they add a little part of their personality and things in there and uh but uh, yeah, yeah, go talk to your 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 uncle, your cousins, your anybody that's old, getting older. You know, nobody has a promise of tomorrow. But capture those stories before they do pass and, away with the mists of time. And everybody, uh, you know, you get people who they haven't got anything to say, but once they're in, like you've just said, in a group of people, suddenly there's something. And, and yeah. sometimes people have genuinely have forgot. It, 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 oh, I don't yeah. know why it, these things get shelved. But it'll jog don't. their memory and it'll be yeah. the most amazing experience you've ever had. Or I'll tell you, have you ever seen anything weird or that you couldn't explain? Well, nah, but there was this one time. Yeah. And then there you go. You, you've got it. You, when did you hear that? But there was this one time. I've even had people say, well, I don't believe in that. But one time when I was a kid, this happened or that happened or mm -hmm. I saw this and that's, wow, that's great. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. Yeah, and do you, do you find yourself saying to them, but, but you don't believe in it, but how do you attribute that account, yeah. that story well, you just and, told and me? Yeah, I've, I've posited that, that to people, you know, like, you don't believe in it, but yet it happened. And mm -hmm. I like to say a skeptic or a non-believer, it's just somebody that hasn't had the right experience yet. Yeah, yeah, good point, Steve, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Steve, do we have more, sorry, Les, do we have more questions? Yeah, I've got a great question in actually from uh, Fred Flintstone. Oh, uh, well, Fred Flintstone. <laughs> yeah, but, but. yeah. Um, question. Uh, if it's a great question, this one, Steve. If there was no human life on Earth, would the cryptid and paranormal phenomena still exist without us? Well, that's that's one of those things. It's kind of like the what came first, the chicken or the egg. Does it exist because of us, or would it be there anyway? I, I like to think that a, a part of it would be there and maybe even greater and stronger. Because if you think about a lot of the cryptids and, and even ghosts and stuff like that, they they tend to shy away from humans or hide from humans. You know, Bigfoot's an elusive creature, Dogman. Uh, maybe if humans weren't in the picture, they'd be out there just uh, doing their own thing willy-nilly and uh, they only have to look out for uh, other animals and stuff. That's, that's hard to say. You know, it's like the old, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear, does it make any sound? But uh, I like to think there, there still would be uh, some sort of activity like that. But then I think uh, humans uh, add to that. And, you know, earlier we talked about, excuse me, the idea of a tulpa, of thought forms, of you concentrating and thinking about something that really gives it the, the power to, you know, and you have things that have started out like that as basically Internet memes like the Slender Man or the Rake. But if you get enough people and with the internet as big as it is, you know, millions of people could read those stories and think about that. And you're putting that out into the universe and it takes that energy and makes it real. There were three little girls where uh, two of them were going to uh, uh, get rid of the other one as a sacrifice to Slender Man. They, they saw things, they experienced things. And uh, there's a, a guy that used to be, uh, he wrote uh, radio and uh, like pulp novels and stuff. Uh, about a guy called the shadow Lamont Cranston was the character's name and he was like a crime fighter he wore a, a slouch hat and a big red scarf and, a, and an overcoat and uh, Walter um, Gibson I believe was the man's name well he was kind of like me he liked to work on several things at a time but this was with the technology at the time he had like six typewriters and he would go from one typewriter to another working on these different stories he wrote thousands of those shadow stories and radio plays and uh, even to the point where he started seeing this character Lamont Cranston that he created appear in his uh, apartment in Greenwich Village in New York and um, so he was we're talking a, about a true thought, thought form. yeah and he, he called it a thought form but it's, it's a tulpa it's and and literally this man you know with six typewriters and thousands of stories 
you think about the hours he sent there and literally poured his soul into this character, blood, sweat, and tears went into those keystrokes. Mm -hmm. And he was having a dinner party one time and up in the, the upper part of the loft of the apartment, people, other people saw the shadow, the Loma Lot Cranston with a hat and a scarf. And they asked him about it. I said, oh, that's cute. You hired somebody to dress up as Lamont and appear. He said, no, that's that's a thought form. He said, I see it here all the time. I see it flip from one room to the other or I see it peeking around the corner. He said, my mind created that. That's a, a psychic imprint. And I believe that can happen. I, yeah, I truly yes. do. Well, I'm, I'm not about to disagree. It's, it's an interesting uh, concept. It really is. Now, if Les ain't got another question, uh, oh, you want to answer? I, I, I'll probably just get one more in, guys. Yeah, yeah. it's all good. Uh, uh, if Steve's yeah. happy with questions, I'll, I'll Yeah, happy. one more, then uh, we can carry on. Uh, Lorraine Groves is asking, uh, and welcome to the show, Lorraine. Uh, does Steve think a Bigfoot is dangerous, as certain people say they won't survive an encounter if they met one? I, I think it depends on the Bigfoot. Are people dangerous? There, there are people that are totally benign, that are helpful, that are loving, and then there are people that will kill you for five dollars or uh, take any way thing they can get from you and uh, mistreat you. And again, I, I don't think it's you would be painting with a broad brush to say all Bigfoot are evil or all of them are benevolent or all of them are benevolent. I think they're they're individuals uh, just like we are. I, I Again, that's just my knee jerk uh, response to that. I, I would have to think about it some more to form a better opinion. But I think it's like anything there. There's good and bad. Same with ghosts and spirits. There are some that are helpful. There are some that are malevolent and try to drive you away or, or drive you mad. Uh, it's just it's like the differences in people. You know, obviously, where where the Bigfoot are seen primarily, re remote, secluded places. But the people who are having the interactions when they're coming around the camp, is it because they're inquisitive, do you think? Or is it because they're actually trying to scare the campers away? Or are you going to, uh, uh, probably if I'd been asked that question, Steve, I'd have said, well, yeah. all of get, the, the... Yeah, all of the above. And, and I've yeah. had things happen. I was in the Jefferson National Forest in Virginia one time, and I was uh, night hiking uh, with a, just a headlamp, which is something I used to enjoy. And I'd been hearing the, the tree knocks and the yips and the yowls. And I, I got to a point where suddenly little stones, like round, flat river rocks, were coming out of the woods and hitting me. And I didn't feel them hit me. I heard them hit the ground, and I looked down, and I picked one up, and it was warm to the touch, almost like an airport. A lot of times when things just yeah, appear... Yeah. They will be warm to the touch and these rocks and they weren't coming in at an arc like somebody had lobbed them but they were flying straight out of the woods from different directions and striking me and hitting on the ground but it wasn't it didn't hurt like i said i didn't even feel it but I just suddenly i thought you know maybe it'd be a good idea if i just turned around and went a different direction yeah. and i don't for, for a while there i thought that you know bigfoot was throwing rocks at me it was mad at me but the more I've, I've contemplated on that and reflected on that, I think there was something farther on that path that I was on because I was blazing my own trail. I wasn't following a hiking trail or anything. I think there was something that I didn't want to encounter, whether it was a big cat. I mean, this is in Virginia. There are big cats up there. Uh, it could have been a bear with cubs. It could have been, you know, a human with a knife. But I think the big feet, because there was more than one of them, there was at least two, they were actually warning me away from not from them or from something they were trying to protect, but from something that was going to harm me. Now, again, maybe that's just my take on it. It may be 100% wrong, and there's no way to prove it one way or the other. But uh, I don't think they were trying to hurt me or trying to scare me as much as they were like, hey, go a different way. Pick a different trail. You're not following a path what, what, or anything. And what do you attribute the warmth with them? Is it body from whatever we're holding it, or what it more than that? Well, again, it's it, it could be from whatever was hiding. I didn't see anything, but I heard them. I could hear stuff in the forest. It could have been just because I was a long way from anywhere where there was any river rocks. And uh, so it would have had to carry those or like I spoke of an airport, it would have had to airport them from wherever it got them. Or maybe it was just making the airports fly. I don't know what what skills do they possess? You know, a, a friend how of mine. Up, how long is the string? I mean, you, there's yeah. nothing to even measure there. You know the, the Rendlesham Forest incident? You'll have yes. heard of that, Steve, yeah? Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine, uh, Brenda Butler, who's probably, she wrote a book called Sky Crash years ago. It's just been republished with Philip Kinsella and Brenda. And uh, 
she was one of the principal people responsible for getting the story out, um, you know, years and years ago. But she used to go into Rendlesham Forest and she's brought back with her. I think she's still got them, the stones that used to drop in front of them. And when they picked them up, they were warm. You know, mm-hmm. it's a similar thing. I mean, I don't think she attributed it to Bigfoot type phenomena, if but we can call it phenomena. It's like whatever's out there, it can do things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 Steve, one of the things I noted that you, you talked about the giant snake. So we'll just jump away from the Bigfoot and, and the, 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 we've not touched UFOs. I know that no. you've not touched on UFOs a great deal in the books. Can, can you tell us a little bit about the giant snake? Yeah, that was a, a gentleman that my, my mom and dad knew. He was older than them. In fact, they had been in business together at one time. And he was one of those that at first he didn't want to talk. He was afraid that I was just going to, because I was a kid. I mean, he was afraid I was going to laugh at him or make fun of him. But once I got him started, he was another one that was a wealth of stories. And uh, that happened near where I grew up, an area there called Beaver Creek which Beaver Creek in and of itself, there's all kinds of strange things associated with that creek. Uh, the, my experience with the, the thing in the ditch and stuff there, that wasn't probably more than a mile from Beaver Creek. And it goes all the way up into Virginia, I believe. And any place I've, I've, I've ever been along that creek, there's, there's experiences, hauntings and whatnot there. But he was down near the mouth of Beaver Creek there in East Tennessee. And um, now this was a guy that used to, when he lived in Florida, he used to get out and hunt rattlesnakes. He would put stovepipe around his legs so that they couldn't strike him. Right. And then he would hunt snakes and sell them. But uh, he was down there one day and he, he was walking along Beaver Creek in this same area down near the mouth. I've heard lots of different stories. Uh, my brother talked about hearing footsteps down there when there was nobody there. And, uh, but uh, he was trying to find his way back across the creek and uh, he saw what he thought was a log and he was getting ready to step on it and it moved and he said it was as big as a telephone pole but it slithered off across the creek and into the the brush there and he didn't see the head and he said he's kind of glad that he didn't and i I forget what he called it he he misnomered it but he said like a an articulated python or something like that which there it's there is a snake that's similar to what he called it but he thought maybe it had escaped from a a zoo or a traveling sideshow or something like that. But yeah. then you can imagine, and we, and we have snakes in, uh, mm-hmm. in East well, Tennessee and in Appalachia. In the mountains, we have rattlesnakes. We have copperheads and water moccasins. Funny story I can tell you about a water moccasin. But um, they, we don't have any big snakes like that. We certainly don't have mm-hmm. you know, king snakes and uh, rat snakes and corn snakes and you know other non-venomous things. But uh, we don't have anything that big. What would water temperature have been? It's running water. It'd been cold, would it? Uh, it would have been usually like the, the springs there where we lived. The water stayed about 52 degrees year round. Now that, that sounds warm, but you get in that in the summertime when it's hot, it'll, it'll turn your feet blue. Yeah, uh, especially so, so the I'm just water. thinking, you know, because they, they'd need a, a warm climate, surely, wouldn't they? Yeah, no, yeah. and does, it gets cold there. I mean, it freezes and things. The snakes mm-hmm. do go into hibernation, but again, I've never heard anybody else tell a story of a snake that big. Now I've seen some big corn snakes and some big black snakes, but you know, nothing over. So, so basically then Steve, only thing you could attribute it is, is an escaped. Python yeah, a, a, a true a cryptid, cryptic, you know, an, an animal python. that does exist, but uh, is in an area where it's not supposed to be. Uh, there's a, a famous photograph of uh, a kangaroo hopping through a cornfield in Tennessee. I think sometime in the 1950s. Well, kangaroo aren't native to Tennessee. No, no. That's that's you know a cryptozoological anomaly there. How did it get there? It's something that does exist, but it doesn't belong there. So there you are know, things like that too. Well, we we've got it here, don't we? With the big cats, the UK is not supposed to. I love those big cat sightings in the UK. I've seen photographs lots of, them. Yeah, well, of I've a got silhouette of a big cat, mm. and it's like those don't exist. But that's like I think they do. People just you know it's a big cat. Oh. It stays on its own. It has a territory where it hunts. And then, like you were mentioning, there are areas where strange things happen. Uh, you know, I've been sent some footage last few weeks of on two, I was taking on two phones of the same cat of some guys having a, a break in the van in a remote place, and they've got it crossing the field. I put a few stills on it onto Facebook, <clears throat> and you know, people who know me, I'll not just 
I'll sit on fence and say, well, it could be, it couldn't be. This is a big cat. And I, I don't know what I can do with footage at the moment. So that's why I've not put it out as moving footage. And, but it definitely is. Uh, it's because it, people think it's in water, Steve, but it's a, mm -hmm. a bright sunny day on frozen land. And as it's walking, it looks like it's in water. But that's what it is. So, Steve, you touched on on uh, Dogman, Werewolf earlier. You, you you mentioned it. Have you have you got any reports of that? On, and what are your views on it? Because it seems to be coming a lot more prevalent. A lot more people are talking about it. Yeah, and again, I don't know if it's one of those where more people are talking about it and they're feeding into it and that's what's making it appear or the world's a smaller place now and we're just hearing more reports of it. Uh, I've never seen one or encountered one myself. I've heard things that it didn't sound like a bear. It, it sounded more like a dog or a wolf. But again, it could have been either one of those. could have been a wild dog. But again, those people that, that see it, they've seen something. They've seen a... a a bipedal creature that looks like a cross between a dog and a wolf stomping around uh, out here. I'm near the Four Corners area. Uh, Skinwalker Ranch is a good example of that. They've seen a dog man there. The, I can't remember the lady's name that her and her husband first had to, some of the encounters there. She was looking at her kitchen one morning and saw what looked like a portal open up in the field. Crawled and out. a dog man type creature comes out on two legs stomps by, glares at her, and then and the portal closes back up, and then it goes on about its business. And uh, I've heard stories out here. And again, I'm, I'm right in the edge of the Navajo Nation reservation. The older people, despite, you know, my recommendation of talking to old people, the, the elders of those tribes, the Native American tribes, they will not talk about stuff. Now, some of the younger people, you could get them to talk to you, but uh, the elders know better. They're afraid they'll bring it to them. In case they evoke it, as you took the yeah. But yep. uh, yeah, out here, uh, the old uh, Route 66 up through uh, New Mexico, and uh, it goes through three of the, the four states there in the, the four corners. There's been dogman sightings, uh, shapeshifters. So uh, again, dogman, werewolf, the, the, those lines have kind of become blurred now. Between I, I think it's a name myself. I mean, yeah. they, I think, I think we're, we're, people are arguing over a name, Steve. I think we're probably dealing with the same thing. Uh, and I think where it gets blurred for me is if you mention werewolf, people just throw themselves into movies and, 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 and fantasy. I don't necessarily think that there's anything transforming from man to beast. I, yeah. I, I could be wrong, but that's just personally, I don't think that. Uh, but as soon as you mention werewolf, people jump to that. And I'm wondering if that's why people have latched onto the name, they want to call it the Dogman, because it's almost like the camps are split. But ultimately, yeah. during the making of Wolflands, we, I come to think that we're dealing with the same thing. You know? Yeah, I, I tend to agree. It's just a person's perception. And again, it's just a name. It's uh, whatever you, you pin on it, and then that's kind of the way it goes for a while. But uh, And again, I don't think it's necessarily like a, a human that's been cursed to, to transform, although there are stories out here of the, the Native American shamans and uh, medicine men putting a curse on people. And that, yep. that's one of the legends about uh, skinwalkers is those were people that, uh, for whatever reason, uh, consumed human flesh and were cursed with that. And uh, there's just a few miles here. Uh, there's a place called Choke Cherry Canyon. And uh, it's it's a strange place anyway. I've talked to people, sorry, there's a plane going over. There's a no, it's fine. airstrip on the mace up here behind me. But um, I've talked to people that have seen stuff in that area, but uh, there were some famous murders there back in 1974. Uh, I can't remember the guy that wrote the book, but it's called The Broken Circle. And uh, it was kind of a thing here at one time in uh, Farmington, where I live, for the local kids to kind of harass some of the native people, especially the older ones. And there were some high school kids that uh, took it a little too far and ended up killing a man. And um, they mm -hmm. were charged, but because they were Caucasian, it was Caucasian court and all that. There, there's still a lot of animosity out here. And uh, they got off with a slap on the wrist because teenage yeah. uh, Caucasian kids, but one of the, the Navajo medicine men said, oh no, it's not going to go down like that. And he put a curse on these boys and every single one of them died really? in a short amount of time under very unusual circumstances. This, the Broken Circle or a, a, an Unbroken Circle. Can't remember the, the book's title or the, the author, but Broken Circle, I believe. But I've, I've been up to that canyon and there's a feeling up there. There's an eeriness that still pervades. And I think there was stuff there long before those murders happened. And uh, 
But um, what a what a fabulous a bit macabre, Steve. But what a fabulous thing to have been the broken circle to be researching. I don't know if I could have, you could really get your pardon the pun, get your teeth into that kind of research, couldn't you? Yeah, I'm I'm excited about being in the high desert here. Uh, so I've explored pretty much everywhere to, that I wanted to go in the Pacific Northwest. I am going back to Mount Shasta in the summer, but um, and that's a, not really Pacific Northwest. That's Northern California. But uh, I'm excited to be out here. I'm close to the the Four Corners. I'm, I've been to the Aztec ruins. That's 15 minutes from here. Uh, Dulce Base uh, in New Mexico, where they they supposedly crash parts there, alien bodies and alien human hybrids. I'm going to go to Taos and see if I can experience the home there that everybody talks about. Uh, Chaco Canyon is another ruin. So it's about an hour and a half away. It's also an international dark sky park. So you're going to be well places. traveled, Steve. Oh, yeah. yeah and I'm also planning a trip over into Arizona, neighboring state, to the Superstition Mountains. That's okay. a place I've wanted to go ever since I read about it in Jim Brandon's book, Weird America, The Guide to Places <clears> of Mystery in the United States. That came out in 1978. And I was just enthralled. And now I'm well, like a few hours drive from superstition. So I'm headed there as well, soon as well, the weather gets here. Just to, just to cut across you there, Steve, what can you tell us about the Brown Mountain Lights? That's one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. Really? Um, I, I, when I lived uh, for a time in extreme northeastern Tennessee, I lived in a place called Mountain City. And it was a short drive to Brown Mountain. If, if you want anything of substance, you had to go either over into Virginia down into Johnson City or over into Boone, North Carolina. Well, once you're in Boone, that's not that too far to the Brown Mountain Lights. So I went up there several times. And the first time I went, it was at night. And I was sitting there at Wiseman's Gorge looking out over. And to the other side is where you see most of the activity. And I saw it, it looked like somebody carrying a lantern uh, running along the trees over there. And I thought, ah, that's, you know, that's probably all it is. Well, I, I spent the night there and the next morning, when I could see actually what was on the other side of that gorge, it's like a sheer cliff face. There's no way anybody could even crawl over there with a lantern, let alone run through the woods. But I went back, I saw them several times and, and they never failed to uh, exhibit. I, I saw them every time I was there. Now, some people haven't been that fortunate, but later on, I saw them up in the sky. I saw them shooting over the trees. I saw them shooting overhead. Sometimes it would just be a singular light uh, maybe it appeared to be about the size of a basketball and then it would appear into maybe four different lights with different colors and they'd fly different directions and then they'd all group back together and then they'd just wink out. But, uh, what, and I've what heard primary, uh, primarily what color, Steve? I know it's uh, different. Kind of a yellowish, orangish, whitish. I mean, I know that's not a very definitive description there, but no, no, just... sometimes blue, sometimes red, but usually just a, a faint yellow, white, slight orange type thing or pulsating in between that but uh again and you've heard, you heard all the explanations that uh oh it's traffic lights uh people were seeing those lights in those mountains before cars were ever in that area before yeah. trains were ever in that area in fact one of the legends is there was a uh, warring tribes there and uh some of the, the warrior braves that were killed they're doomed forever to roam those uh, hills with the light, trying to, to find their way out. There's also stories of uh, a girl that fell in love with a native and her father wouldn't let them marry. And, and she threw herself off Wiseman's Gorge. And then he, it's her brave, who was her lover, looking for her with a lantern for all eternity. But uh, there have been people in there from the University of North Carolina that have studied that place. They can't reach any conclusions. They've looked into like the piezoelectric uh, properties or literally swamp gas or yeah. a St. Elmo's fire. Um, you you uh, know, things. there's the, there's the Hestalen lights uh, and, and w primarily where we are in East Yorkshire, I'm looking at these lights off the coast. Y your description of them is very, of the Brown Mountain lights is very similar. Uh, did they just appear and then do what they were doing and disappear? Yeah, yeah, sometimes yeah. they would just appear and uh, at times they would be, they seemed like very close. They weren't always on the other side of the gorge there. They would be on the side that I was on. You would see them like maybe down the way. And it, it did kind of look like a train light or something like that, like one of the old steam engine lights, but then it would just wink out. And I, I have seen that same thing on the railroad tracks where they see a spook light or a spook lantern. You'll see it way down the tracks, 
but it doesn't ever come any closer or if it does then it winks out or if you go toward it it'll go out before you can get to it but uh so the, brown mountain the, lights there's also the, the the i think the hornet light there's the marfa lights in texas there's uh different places where there's spook lights like that uh that's so the brown the mountain lights and the brown mountain lights but all the essentially very similar descriptions for everything but what you've seen them, Steve. So when you're looking at them in a really dark place, are they lighting up the area around them? Uh, the, the ones that I observed in the trees, they were. You could see the trunks of the trees and the branches oh, right. and things. Just a little, it's almost like a fluorescent type light. Yeah. It, it, it did give off a glow. Now it wasn't like a bright, like a spotlight or. Not like a flare. Even, no, nothing like no. that. It was just, it was giving off a, a soft light, just in a short radius around the uh, center of where that light was. Uh, and, and the ones in the air, they had, you know, they were brighter in the center and they gave off a softer glow around the, the edges. What, what, what do you think they are, Steve? I mean, but I've termed them ILFs, intelligent light forms. Yeah, because they do act intelligent, the whole thing where they, they hover or they'll zip this way or that way. And this was in a time before drones, you know, the commercial drones yeah. existed. Um, <laughs> So they split and then regroup back together, change color. Again, that's there seems to be an intelligence there, either controlling you, you, them or the light speak, itself has intelligence. I've had people speaking to me and saying, well, it's, it's military technology. Well, I've gone back in, in just in lifeboat logs, decades mm -hmm. and decades. <laughs> and what's presenting yeah. is the same phenomena. So if it's military technology, it's not advanced. Yeah, do, it's, do you know it's, 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 it's military. It's not our military. It's not our because, military because those brown mountain lights. They've seen those uh, 1700s, 1800s yeah. before, you know, Civil War times, and then before we didn't have any technology like that. Well, it's it's totally not. Great. I don't think it's military related. Uh, it's just, like I said, not our military. Maybe military from another planet or uh, or something like that. Some sort of visitors or life forms from elsewhere. But Steve, whatever I'm it is, it likes those mountains. I've had, I had a pile of questions for you, and uh, I'm still on looking at this first page because you've just 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 <laughs> fired away, and it's brilliant. So I told you the, the do, easy part is getting me to talk; the hard part is getting me to be quiet. <laughs> well, what I'm going to do, uh, I don't want to put Les on the spot, but it, because we've got like approximately ten minutes left, I'd, I'd like to see if there's any more questions because uh, it, it's not fair to listeners uh, not to get them in if we can get a few in. Les, is that okay? <laughs> Yeah, sure. And uh, the next that, question. Steve? Oh, absolutely. And again, I apologize for being so loquacious here. And uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm telling stories. I'm a raconteur. That's what I do. And I'll so, give you yeah. every detail that I can remember to make. I want to put you in the experience. And that's why I go really, into such detail. Painted a picture for us of everything exactly. you've right. spoken about. It's yeah, fabulous. It's just quite, yeah, a question from me, Steve, really, this one. is uh, You've been to Mount Shasta. You've seen the, the lights. Now, I've uh, read reports or seen YouTube videos where people actually seen UFOs during the day go into the mountainside. Is, 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 do you think that's correct? I, I, that's what's been reported. I haven't seen that, but I have seen strange lights up on Mount Shasta. Now, it was nighttime, about 2 o'clock in the morning, and it looked like the Brown Mountain Lights, but it was it would, they would have had to been the size. You know, I said the Brown Mountain Lights are about the size of basketball. These would have been the size of an airliner. These were huge lights way up on the mountain. And they would just move along and then wink out. And then they might be over here, again, different colors. But uh, from what I understand, and I know people that live in the area, uh, I interviewed a young lady on Missing Persons and Mysteries that uh, felt Mount Shasta's call. Uh, I think she's originally from Texas. She was living in the Bay Area at the time. She dropped everything she was doing and felt compelled to get camping equipment, outdoor gear, and she went up and lived on, on Mount Shasta in a tent for five months. She had a UFO encounter. Uh, other people, I have a, a guy from a, a Modoc tribe lives up there. He goes by the name Bravehorn. He's seen UFOs. He's seen uh, Bigfoot, uh, tree people, as, as they call them. But uh, it's, it's almost an airport for UFOs. And I've heard that about the, the sides of it opening and UFOs entering um, I've got a video on 13 Past Midnight, kind of a little mini documentary, about 30 minutes that I did on the origins of Mount Shasta and some of the stuff that people have seen there. It's one of those, it's a hot spot for everybody. 
Uh, you go to Shasta today, there are New Agers, there are cultists, there are hikers and campers, there are UFO people, there are Bigfoot people, a little bit of everything. And it's there is a power there. Now, um, he was talking about um, Joshua Tree, which is another place. And you're mentioning places where there's a, a just a hodgepodge, just a mix of paranormal stuff. Uh, one of the gentlemen from the Eagles, the rock band, back in the 70s said, man, Joshua Tree is everybody's power spot. And it is. There's all kinds of stuff there. But Shasta's that way, too. There's something for everyone there. If you like UFOs, if you're looking for Lemurians and the Ascended Masters, and that's a whole other story. Uh, if you're looking for ghosts and fairies, they've seen uh, the Fae there at uh, McLeod, the Falls in McLeod on the slopes of Shasta. Uh, the robot grandma story that happened on Mount Shasta. Um, the two most compelling Bigfoot stories I've ever heard. One lady was camping on Mount Shasta and saw what she described as a female Sasquatch giving birth to a baby on the slope in Mount Shasta. About a year later in the same area, they didn't know each other, didn't have any idea, but another lady was camping in the same area. She reported what she described as a female Sasquatch nursing a baby Sasquatch. So there you go. One lady saw it born, another lady, no relation, no connection, saw a year later a mother nursing a baby. So that's yeah, that's just amazing to me. Yeah, that's <laughs> and that just that to me that validates both stories, yeah, especially just, since they didn't know each other, didn't compare notes or anything. Brilliant connections, aren't they? Have we got more Liz? Got a, yeah, I've got a question from. Um, still, let's have a look. Still not got Kim, to this frightening story, and we're not going to get to it. But these questions are good. <laughs> well, somebody in the chat has just uh, asked us to add another hour onto the stream. But well, uh, it, it's, a few people have said we need a part two for Steve, and I've just I never reply in chat during live, but I have done. I've just said for sure because if you'll come back, Steve, we do want you back. Oh, absolutely. We just pick yeah. up where we left off. I will tell you <laughs> that my most frightening encounter. It involves the black-eyed children or the black-eyed kids, and I have a video about 30 minutes worth over on 13 Past Midnight where I tell the whole story start to finish. Well, So I'll, I'll gonna... come back here and tell it, but in the meantime, if they'd like to go over there and listen, you, you can get uh, – that's the short version of it, the half-hour version. No, okay. well, I'm looking forward to hearing it, so – there's, there's, there's a date. We're going we're gonna to set that one. Come on, Liz, please. Right, I've got a question from Kim King. Uh, as a child, Steve, have you dealt with any out-of-body experiences? Yeah, I had a, a very unusual one one time. I thought it was a dream, but looking back on it, I think it was an out-of-body experience. Um, I had laid down on the couch and went to sleep. And suddenly, I wasn't asleep on the couch anymore. I was outside playing. And I went into the house, and when I walked in, I saw myself asleep on the couch. And the minute that I saw myself, it was like, I heard like a whooshing noise. Like, and then I woke up on the couch. And again, when I was little, I thought that was just because I was, you know, seven, eight years old. I thought, boy, that was a weird dream. But looking back on that, I think I had an out-of-body experience. I think I left my body. I went outside. I came back in and when I saw myself, it shocked me. And uh, they talk about like a golden cord or a golden cable. There was some sort of connection like that to me and the me I saw sleeping on the couch. But when I saw me, it was just such a frightening thing that it, it pulled me back into my body. Again, either a very weird, very vivid dream or I had an out-of-body experience. Fabulous. All right, Rats. Yeah, and uh, I've got to ask this question. It's from Jack Todd. Uh, did Steve ever work with David Pilatus? Um, I know David. I'm friends with David. Uh, we've been Facebook friends uh, for about, I say since 2012 or so. Uh, we haven't worked together on everything. We cover some of the same stories, but he has a kind of different angle. He's he's the whole missing 411 phenomenon. His cases have to meet certain criteria before he considers them for that. And mine does any missing person case is a missing person's case. They don't have to fit any certain narrative or anything for me to cover them. Uh, I have met David in person. I, uh, at Squatch Fest, I think that was in 2021 or 2022 in, uh, Washington state. I met him there, had my picture made with him. And, uh, 
he's a good guy. He's very intense, but it just he does things differently than I do. And, uh, I do respect his work and what he's done to raise awareness of the cases that he does cover, because that's the thing to me. It's keeping the people's faces and names out there uh, for the family. I mean, anytime a, a parent outlives a child, that's a tragic, tragic thing. But to not have any closure to like Dennis Martin's dad, he went to his grave, not knowing whatever happened to his son. And I saw an interview with him one time, just broke my heart. Uh, and he said, I'm always thinking that one day there'll be a knock at the door and I'll go and answer the door. There'll be a handsome man standing there and they'll say, yes, can I help you? And then this man will say, dad, it's me. It's Dennis. I've come home. And that never happened. I mean, the man passed away, I think in 2015 on Halloween, my birthday, no less. And uh, never had that closure. Went to his grave, not knowing whatever happened to Dennis. And that that's got to be just sheer torture. Yeah. So, you know, raise the signal, boost awareness, get their names and faces out there. I think we ought to bring back uh, putting missing kids on milk gardens. You, you fellas probably remember when we did that. Yeah. And uh, I think that's what it's all about. You know, I've, I've covered the missing people in our area in the first book. And, and, and a little bit in the second book. I, and I don't mean I, I find it difficult to talk about because they're not worthy of talking about. What I find, I mean, I know we're short of time here, but what, what, what I find most disturbing is some people think it's entertainment. Yeah, and, I, I even had somebody comment the other not. day on my big channel, like um, it was, I don't even remember which case it was, but the commenter actually said, uh, this doesn't fit the criteria. Shame on you. I'm like, criteria for what? Being missing? It's a person and they're missing. They're missing persons. And I think they were comparing it to the missing 411 and how it didn't okay. fit polite as a spooky criteria. But to me, any one missing person is just as they're in. I'll cover anybody's case. I yeah. don't care. So uh, we've got four minutes left. We might be able to fit another question in. I don't know whether we can. Let's go in. Yeah, I've got a question from Dubs and Buds 666. Uh, welcome to the show, if you're still on the stream. Steve, do you think you have a special ability to see all these sightings? Well, according to my grandmother, I do. And uh, again, she was superstitious and it had to do with being born with a veil or a call over my face. Again, superstition. But there's, there's something about me that attracts this stuff. And uh, I can't explain it. Like I said earlier, I thought every place I'd ever lived was haunted to some degree, but I discovered really just a few years ago that it's me that's haunted. So whatever it is, it takes an interest in me. Um, I have RH negative blood. There, there's a whole field of study on that that claims that that's maybe alien blood that because so few people have it. I'm second rarest blood type. I'm B negative. Actually, the third. There's a RH null that has neither marker. I don't know how that works. But I have green eyes. I've been told that I'm an indigo child and a star seed and all this. Again, you can't prove it by me, but people that, that know those things and study those things see those traits in me. So I'll leave it with that. But I have had a lifetime of experiences. And uh, I'm so pleased that you've come on. I'll save these questions because I don't really need them, do I? They'll do for next time. Steve. Save them for part two. I'd love to yeah, come back yeah. whenever you guys would have me. So unless let's can fit a real quick question in. Uh, we can wind this up. I've got a question from one day in December. Um, question for Steve. Do you believe the UK has uh, Bigfoot slash trolls? I, I think so, especially trolls and, and the Fey folk. Again, in those Celtic countries where the Fey were almost like a religion, you can look at reports where they described back in the 1700s, 1800s, hairy creatures that they considered part of the Fey. That's Bigfoot. They talked about little men that came from the sky in a horseless wagon. That's a UFO yeah. encounter. Uh, I believe so. And I, and I want to get to the UK. I've been invited over to speak. Uh, I was introduced to a guy that I believe, in, I'm probably getting it wrong, but the head of the UK Paranormal Speakers Bureau or something like that. And he said, Steve, please come. I'll book you in any city you want to go to. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. Be good to meet, Steve. I hope you do. And I'd, I'd love to meet you guys in person. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it'd be excellent. Yeah. Well, Steve Stockton, you've made it really easy for me tonight, my friend, and uh, I'm sure that our listeners have enjoyed it. I, 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 I found myself getting a bit too comfortable. I've talked over you. I wouldn't let you get a word in edgewise. Yeah, I apologize, but this, this is what I do, my friend. <laughs> no, it's, it's all good, and you can talk over me next time. So we'll definitely book this again. 
and I'm just going to say good night and thank you everybody for listening and thank you Steve, thanks Les, Sky, Alison and everybody that's contributed. Just don't forget hit the like, yeah. subscribe yeah. if you haven't done already, and thank you very much from me. Good night. Thank, thanks from my uh, people yeah. that are here. Thanks to you, uh, Les and Paul for for letting me come on here. Thanks to the mods and everybody in chat. Uh, my folks, like, share, subscribe, and I'll see you later on Thirteen Past Midnight. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, on that note, uh, I got to say it's been a privilege and an honour to have Steve on the show tonight. Always great to listen to uh, these accounts and his personal accounts. So I hope you've enjoyed the show. Thanks everybody for coming on to tonight's stream from the UK and around the world. And uh, thanks Steve for bringing uh, uh, your listeners to the stream as well. And uh, yes, if we can get uh, more likes, if we can get more subscribers. That would be fantastic. And uh, we're going to see you all next week. Good night.